Thanks. Good evening. Welcome to our monthly business meeting of the uh, Unified Government of athens Clark County. We appreciate those of you that are here with us in person and also those that are watching remotely from uh, home or online. Uh, if you'd like to have an agenda to follow along with us, they're on the table to the right of the doors as you leave here. Or if you're uh, watching remotely, you can get one at AthensClarkCounty.com on our website. Uh, Ms. Brown, would you call the roll, please? Dickerson? Here. Sims? Here. Link? Here. Wright? Here. Bailey? Neesmith? Here. Bale? Herod? <coughs> Gertz? Hamby? Here. We Thank you. <laughs> Great. <laughs> And I have one more reminder I'd like to make tonight is that if you have an electronic device here with you, many of you are not frequent uh, attenders, please turn them off or just silent so they don't disturb the meeting. Ms. Bratton, would you call the roll, please? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I need a motion to approve the minutes. I got out of order. Second. Okay. Um, do we have any written communications? No, we don't. Not tonight. Okay. We'll now begin our monthly business meeting. Uh, there'll be several opportunities for citizen input tonight. The first... We need to vote on approving the minutes. I'm sorry. Did we just vote to approve the minutes? I thought we did. There we go. All in favor of approval of minutes? Aye. 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 Okay. We're now, we're now legal. Uh, and we'll go into our monthly business meeting. Uh, there'll be several opportunities tonight for citizen input. The first will be items on the proposed consent agenda, which are items 1 through 3, then items 4 through 11, which are listed under old business. Rules of the Commission allow each speaker three minutes uh, to speak to, to any item on the agenda. There's a light on Ms. Bratlin's desk that will turn yellow when you've got 30 seconds left. Uh, so please have your comments uh, finished before it turns red so I don't need, won't need to interrupt you. We'll also po hold a public hearing on the items for our, uh, from our Planning Commission, items 12 through 14, which will be heard and acted on uh, separately. Uh, one at a time, we'll have the public comment and then we'll come behind the rail and discuss and vote. Uh, there, there's a little bit different rules on the input for uh, for planning items. State law allows 10 minutes pro and con, but those have to be signed up for in advance. So if we have, and I think we have a couple of those, but anyone who just uh, comes to the podium other than that will be restricted to the three minutes on the zoning items as well. Um, there'll be one final opportunity to, at the end of the meeting that any citizen can speak to us about anything that they'd like to talk to us about that was not on tonight's agenda. I'd ask you to please refrain from cheering or jeering or any other demonstrations and please be respectful of the speakers that are at the podium. Uh, and, at this, and now is the time that we'll go to our consent agenda and if there's uh, citizens who would like to speak to items one through three, this would be the time to come to the podium, give us your name and address and which item you're speaking to. Anyone wish to speak to items one through three? Okay, we'll come behind the rail. Uh, is anyone that would like to remove anything from the consent? Okay, do I have a, mo have a motion, Mr. Neesmith? And we have two ordinances. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the first is an ordinance to me in the code of athens Clark County, Georgia, with respect to traffic control change at the East Broad Street Railroad crossing and for other purposes. The next is an ordinance to me in the code of athens Clark County, Georgia, with respect to parking for persons with disabilities on right-of-way to be dedicated in the future to be known as Green Lane and for other purposes. Thank That's you, Mr. All. Beerman. Who did the second? Was that Mr. Sims? Okay. Okay, we have a motion second. All in favor of adoption of this consent agenda? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. We'll, we'll now move to the, the second uh, opportunity for citizen input, and that's for items 4 through 11 uh, on our tonight's agenda. So if anyone would like to speak to those items, please give us your name and address. Let us know which item you're speaking to and remember our time frame. Uh, I'm Clint McCrory, 390 Franklin Street. I'm speaking on item six, lane configurations. Um, I support Commissioner Link's commission to find option to delay the repaving of Chase Street so that staff can analyze other options for uh, the roadway from Dairy Pack all the way out to, all the way into Prince Avenue. I'd like to point out that this would be a routine process if we had a comprehensive complete streets ordinance. And one thing that we're missing by not having such an ordinance is that we have very limited opportunities for public input on uh, street, on transportation issues. Um, 
I'd also like to remind you that the delaying of this um, repaving so that further study can be done is supported by several neighborhood associations, including Bull the Boulevard Neighborhood Association and the parents of the Chase Street School students. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McCrory. Tyler Dewey, 149 Tracy Street. I'm also speaking about item six. Madam Mayor, Commissioners, Bike Athens is always eager to talk about new bike infrastructure in Athens Clark County. Tonight, however, despite the agenda item that would create two small sections of bike lane, disjointed policy has created a situation where we have bike lanes but no bike projects. In talking about the recent public forum, staff noted, quote, the purpose of the public forum is not to discuss possible bicycle or pedestrian improvements in athens Clark County. Rather, the purpose of the public forum is to discuss possible restriping of the lane configuration on the streets that will be resurfaced this fall, end quote. The buffered bike lanes on Riverbend Parkway, while wonderful, are not being installed per any local policy, as it is a two-lane road. A section of Chase Street may also get bike lanes, but again, they are not being installed per a complete streets policy or a bike master plan. On the four-lane section between Row and Dairy Pack, bike lanes are included, but the four to three road diet memo from 2005 restricts the analysis to motor vehicle movements. As a result, staff cannot tell us how those bike lanes will improve the environment for those on bike. At the public forum, we asked the Chase Street we asked how the Chase Street bike lanes would improve the bike level of service. Staff told us such an analysis is outside the scope of existing policy. On Chase, the restricted nature of the complete streets policy leads to a strange outcome. The entire corridor is being repaved. However, since complete streets doesn't apply to repaving, staff cannot look at improvements on the section that is both a safe route to school and has been on the bike master plan since the plan's adoption almost 15 years ago. So where there is a school and heavy bike traffic, there is no public process to look at bike or pedestrian improvements. And even where there are bike lanes, staff cannot analyze their impact. There is a tool to reconcile these discrepancies, a strengthened complete streets policy that applies to all projects. We support any such policy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dilley. I'm Tony Eubanks, 785 North Pope Street. I usually prepare remarks to come up here so I can make a coherent thought, but um, there's so many th there's so many aspects to this Chase Street um, repaving project that um, I don't really know how to speak except for from my heart. Uh, Madam Mayor, I was, I was pleased to receive your email last week saying that you're going to support Ms. Commissioner Link's commission defined option. I'm also, I was also pleased to hear that you announced to the Clark County Democratic Party that you were going to support Commissioner Link's commission defined option to postpone this Chase Street repaving until we can look at a further uh, look at the street from Prince Avenue all the way to Newton Bridge Road. Um, my daughter goes to Chase Street. She is one of one third of the school population of 500 that walks or bikes to school. Um, there are no crosswalks at Chase Street School. There are three crosswalks at 1010 Prince Avenue, the medical center at 1010 Prince Avenue. And I use one of those crosswalks every day. It works. People stop. It's amazing. <laughs> I think we could probably use one a little further down the street at Debose and um, at, at Debose and, and Chase Street. Um, I'm disheartened that the only reason we have any opportunity to have public input tonight is because of the tail end of Chase Street being a four-lane road that's being repaved, and under the 19 uh, the 2005 road diet policy, we have to consider bike lanes on any such re uh, repaving. Chase Street's a safe route to school. We got 160 kids coming and going by foot or by bike. Complete streets does not necessarily put mean put bike lanes where they won't fit. It means look at the pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure and make improvements wherever you can. We have an opportunity to make improvements to both bike and pedestrian safety. 
I'm not asking you to put bike lanes on Chase Street from Prince Avenue to Boulevard. They don't fit. I am asking you to consider postponing this so that we can look at pedestrian improvements along the corridor for the kids that are doing what we're asking them to do, walk and bike to school. I'm president of the school council, Chase Street School Council, and we wrestle every year. How can we make the, the traffic problem in front of Chase, how can we decrease it? How can we diminish the traffic problem? And one of the first things we do is ask parents to let your kids walk and bike to school. I appreciate you all supporting Commissioner Link's Commission to Find Option to look at ways to improve the safety for those who are doing exactly what we're asking them to do. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Eubanks. My name is Peter Dale. I live at 650 Boulevard, and I have uh, three food establishments in Athens, and uh, I'm speaking in regard to item 11, downtown issues. Uh, two issues that affect my businesses. One is uh, a potential closure of Newton Street between Prince and Meg's. Um, I have a business, Sea Bear Oyster Bar, that is in the Bottle Works on Prince. Uh, as you'll recall, two years ago, the Bottle Works was, uh, had a lot of vacancies, was in decline. It's now vibrant, thriving, uh, thanks to new ownership. Those owners sought out local businesses to open in those vacant spaces. We were recruited among others. And what was key to us was solving the misconception in the community that there was a lack of parking at the Bottle Works, which you'll know there's not. There's 100 spaces behind the building on Meg Street. So what was key to us in signing the lease was that the owners would make a concerted effort to promote the fact that we had a lot of parking available. One of the things they did was worked with athens Clark County to change the direction of the street. As you know, Newton is a one-way street. It once flowed from Meg's to Prince and now flows from Prince to Meg's. If a customer is coming to downtown Athens down Prince, they're now able to make a right on Newton make a ride on Meg's and there's a hundred parking spaces available to them and they now frequent the businesses and the bottle works and it's thriving and it's, it's a wonderful place um, and it's what we want for our community. So I would encourage you all to, to think about um, the, the tenants in the, in the bottle works and this pledge that was made to us by our, by our landlords to uh, secure uh, adequate parking. I think also that we should be concerned more with an overall view of Prince Avenue rather than one small section. And I would love to speak to you at greater length at another occasion about uh, ideas on how to improve Prince as a whole rather than stopgap measures here and there. The other issue that I'll speak to very quickly is uh, pertaining to the National, my restaurant that's on Hancock here downtown. We have a sidewalk cafe, a sidewalk cafe permit. Um, you may not be aware that in the code, it does not allow uh, any glass on the sidewalk, and that pertains to the cafes as well. We were recently informed that the police department is considering enforcing that code, which has not been enforced in the past. This is problematic to us. As you know, Athens has become known for its food scene as much as its music scene. Its restaurants thrive, and if we were forced to serve nice wine and nice cocktails, in plastic cups. I think that would be detrimental to the overall quality of what we're able to offer our guests who are Athenians and visitors from afar. So uh, when that issue comes up, I hope um, that I could speak to you in, 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 in greater detail. Um, but that's something that we believe is coming up in the near future and would appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dale. Good evening. I'm Bill Bushnell, attorney here in Athens. I live at 175 Devonshire Drive. I'm here to speak to item number 11, and I'm aware from talking to some of the commissioners that we're not going to be approving anything tonight, but I'm going to be, uh, my point is addressing, and I sent you all a little memo on the very thing Peter just talked about, and that's the change to uh, the green space between the grit and now what is Tzatziki's. I used to be in favor of that. <laughs> Uh, but then we had an engineering study when our new partners came in from Parkside Partners and they reversed after an engineering study, they reversed Prince or Newton to Prince and put a four-way stop. And previously, people leaving the bottle works either had to go left and fight the Prince traffic, go up Finley and then down Megs, 
or go down and hit what we call the pie, and the pie is that thing where you can turn right, but very difficult to do that. And with the increased number of trucks and traffic in that area serving the Bottle Works and the preschool that's over at the Baptist Church, that was a real congested area. Now it's as good as can be. There's a few slight improvements, and it's my understanding that tonight the recommendation is simply to deal with referring it to staff at the master plan, which is fine. But like Peter said, uh, in the last two years, the change at the Bottle Works has been tremendous. And Mike, I talked to you about this in the past, and I've talked to you. Uh, Melissa about this and and uh, we're we're very happy with what we have right there and I don't think uh, it could be a better situation um, the four-way stop at Newton and Meg's is ideal people are coming in and they're stopping and looking for the parking lot they turn right they turn left and like Peter said they're in the parking lot and it really has changed the congestion that we had there and two years ago we didn't have that congestion now we're 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 full and we do so it's a good it's a good thing and as one of the now minority owners, um, minority has its, has its voice. But that's all I have to uh, say on behalf of Parkside. And I know when it comes up to staff, we're going to work and see if we can make some other improvements. Allison, I got your reply, and I appreciate that as well. Thank you, Mr. Bush. That's now. all we have. Thank you. My name is John Williams, <clears throat> and I'm here tonight representing uh, Athens Regional Medical Center on the rezoning that was held over. Uh, I won't add to what we said last week other than to remind the commission that this was a, a recommended for approval by the staff and subsequently by the Planning Commission. And if anybody has any questions about the specific rezoning, I'm happy to answer them and hear uh, with Mr. Jim Hopkins from the hospital as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Anyone else wish to speak? Okay. Uh, we'll come back behind the. Oh, I'm sorry. Was somebody coming forward to speak? Uh, good evening. My name is Gretchen Elsner. My mailing address is Post Office Box 562, Athens, Georgia. Um, I'd like to comment on uh, item six and just uh, um, encourage that all opportunities to include bike infrastructure in our transportation planning is a. Uh, paid as much attention to as possible. Um, you know, there are municipalities all over the world, local governments that are dealing with the intrusion of uh, fossil fuel infrastructure, which is how we power our cars, but you don't necessarily have to get around on a car. Um, local municipalities up in uh, Seattle and Portland area have been trying to stop um, shipping and uh, mining equipment from being able to dock. You know, their local governments are trying to stop or used to be trying to stop a large shell offshore joy drilling rig from going up to Alaska. Um, all around the world, you know, there are other examples of this where local governments are under threat from the kind of fossil fuel infrastructure that allows us to continue to just drive our cars everywhere here in this country. Uh, for instance, South Sudan, which is one of the youngest democracies on the planet. There are a lot of local municipalities who have international companies like from Texas who want to come and drill for oil there. And, you know, they're trying to find ways to stop this kind of exploitation of their land. Well, why do we need all of these fossil fuels? So that we can keep driving to the outskirts of Athens and buy products that have been shipped here from halfway around the world. So, um, and then we also see that when extreme weather events such as Hurricane Katrina hit, that if we don't have good transportation infrastructure available for people, then it's really hard to get out of the way of some of these kinds of storms. So, um, like our president said at the commemoration of that storm, it's a failure on the part of government to plan for the causes and also the effects of climate change. And people can't take their lives into their hands just to ride their bike somewhere, you know, if, if they feel like it's a moral obligation that they have, like I do. I know that I'm not the only person, it might sound like, you know, crazy radical talk to feel as if they're responsible for for instance, the things that local governments in South Sudan are going through, but I happen to live in a country where I can take advantage of access to news and information and try to make informed decisions about how I conduct my life because it's we here in this part of the world that are able to make those kinds of changes. And so it's incumbent on especially our local governments to take those responsibilities in hand, which is something that you can very ably do when projects like the Chase Street repaving come up and you can say, okay, well, let's put some, make sure that we at least, you know, put some signage, <laughs> you know, just paint a stripe down the side of the road. So, um, you know, because there are people out there who are risking their lives to 
you know, just try to make some very, very simple changes in the way that our world operates. And we don't have much time left, so neither do I. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Elsner. Tim Denson, 290 Midway Road. Uh, I would first like just to speak uh, <clears throat> in the capacity of For Athens for Everyone. Um, Athens for Everyone as an organization asks that the Mayor Commission suspend plans on repaving uh, Chase Street until we can come up with a, with a more comprehensive approach that fits this street. Um, I think this shows that the complete streets policy, when it is actually implemented as it should be, uh, needs to be flexible so it can take on and actually fit the need of the neighborhoods and the streets that you are implementing it on. Uh, with saying that, because a lot of other people have said things, said it much better than I have, uh, personally, as Tim Denson, I want to speak also on uh, item number nine on the Cooperative Extension Service Center. Um, I would like to just say that I am very much in favor of uh, having it put on uh, Gain School Road. I think that area could very much use something like this. And I think it could uh, spur some other very good uh, development coming in that area, which is desperately needed, I think. Commissioner Herod here would agree with me. And also, uh, this is a great agenda here, lots of good stuff. On, on number, which one is it here? Number eight on Athens Clark County Jail Inmate Telephone Service Contract Award. I know my comments aren't going to do anything about this here, but I would just like to point out that we are, the county is going to actually take in a profit of $250,000 on people in jail simply trying to talk to their families, trying to talk to their legal services outside of the prison. And we are going to be taking in $250,000 um, on that. I think that was per year, possibly, by the time it gets to the end of it, um, after the jail expansion. That's pretty disgusting to me, I have to say. I think it's something we should all be thinking about and how we want to deal with our, our justice system here and how we want to deal with the families that have people in that, in that system. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Denson. Hi, um, my name is Laura Connery, and I live at 436 Hill Street, Apartment 5. Um, and I am going to speak a little bit about Item 6 and bike safety. Um, <laughs> some of you here might know me as your kid's trapeze teacher, or you might have seen me biking around town at some point, since biking has been my primary source of transportation for the last six years in Athens. Um, but unfortunately, I won't be on a bike or a trapeze for a while, um, probably a couple of months, which is <laughs> going to be pretty hard. Um, and that's because just a couple weeks ago, a um, motorcyclist turned in front of me while I was biking without looking and forced me to brake suddenly and flip over the handlebars on my bike. Um, this happened in daylight while I was following um, traffic laws and doing everything I felt like was in my power to keep myself safe. Um, but unfortunately, bike accidents like that are really common in Athens. Um, and a lot of cyclists end up a lot worse than I did. There are a lot of really good things about biking. Um, it's really healthy. It's really good for the environment. It's an affordable means of transportation. But it's also really dangerous in Athens. And I don't think that it has to be. <laughs> um, I'd like to ask the mayor and commission to strengthen the complete streets ordinance by making it apply to all roads when they are repaved and not just the infrequent instance that they are completely reconstructed um, and to consider making Chase Street much more bike friendly. Thank you. Thank you. Hope you, hope you heal fast. I was wondering if it was the trapeze or the bike that did that to you. Hey, my name is Chris Shahagan. I live at 127 Herman Street, and Chris, just want to make your last name um, H A A G. Uh, and just a few, few comments about the complete streets in Athens. Um, I like to ride a bike; it's healthy and fun, and uh, it's nice when it's safe. But today, I was driving along Lumpkin to go to Five Points, and it was really cool because within a five minute period I saw 12 people on bikes and lots of pedestrians and then traffic flowing really well and a decade or so ago 
you could not ride a bike on that road. I, I used to try, I'd go on the sidewalk, and then crossing it was very difficult. Uh, so here's an example of being able to handle the same amount of traffic. Uh, it flows better. Cars are encouraged to go slower because you can only go as fast as the, the car ahead of you. Um, that road diet example would not work all across Athens, but if there's a the traffic volume that warrants it, um, it can be very successful. And I think that we should applaud these successes that we've had and build on them. So um, uh, thanks for your work and continuing to make Athens roads safer for all of us. Because it, it, it's a win-win for everybody. There's, there's nobody losing here. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Haig. Anyone else wish to speak? Don't want to leave anybody out. OK, we'll come behind the rail. And we will start with uh, item number four, which is the request from Williams and Associates for the Hospital Authority of Clark County. Do we have an ordinance bill? Yes, there are two for this one. The first is an ordinance to amend the Code of Athens, Clark County, Georgia, with respect to amending the official future development map of Athens, Clark County by changing the designation of an approximate 4.065 acre portion of the approximate 7.07 acre tract of land at 450 Gaines School Road from traditional neighborhood to Main Street business and for other purposes. The next is an ordinance to be in the Code of Athens, Clark County, Georgia with respect to rezoning an approximate 4.065 acre portion of an approximate 7.07 .07 acre tract of land located at 450 Gaines School Road from RS15 GSRC AZ3 single family residential gain school road corridor airport overlay to CO GSRC AZ3 commercial office gain school road corridor airport overlay and for other purposes. Thank you, Mr. Beerman. Mr. Herod, this is your district. Would you like? That's Mr. Sims's district. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought. Mr. Uh, Madam Sims. Mayor, I asked that uh, this be held on the uh, at the last uh, meeting that we had due to the fact that this piece of property was what we were looking at at the site selection committee. We've had that discussion as a, in a work session, and I am going to make a motion that we approve the request coming from the Planning Commission to change the future development map as well as the zoning on this project. So uh, I guess we need to do it in two phases. I'd like to make a motion to change the future development land map first. Okay, we have a motion. We have a second. Mr. A point of clarification, Commissioner sure. Sims, there's two options in front of us. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. Have anybody else having discussion? We have a motion and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And I'd like to make a motion to change the zoning as requested by the Planning Commission. Have a motion. That's the one where, do we, hey, Commissioner Sims, are you moving option one or option two? Um, so option oh, okay. That, oh, I see. That's what Andy was talking about. What was option number one? Yeah, with we'll we'll yeah, go ahead and explain those first, yeah. please. When Mr. Griffin and I were preparing these ordinances and reviewing everything, we realized that this would, would cause a split zoning of a larger tract. And so that's something that traditionally the mayor and commission have tried to avoid. So the option two just requires mm -hmm. that the commercial office segment, uh, if it is ever developed and, and a plan for that is approved, that there be a subdivision dividing the two, uh, retaining the residential on the back portion and making the uh, a lot that's only CO in the front. That's option number two. That's option number two. Uh, yes. Option. OK, we have a motion for option number two. Do we have a second? I'll second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion further? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. We'll go to item number five, which is uh, the ADDA proposed uh, community events program. Mr. Hamby, would you like to discuss that for us? Sure, I'll be glad to. Um, as y'all know, this is something that comes before us every year. This is, uh, this is uh, some money that uh, is allocated to the uh, ADDA that comes from the hotel motel tax. And um, it's not actually allocated to the ADDA, but uh, you task the ADDA with coming up with some recommendations to send back to this body for approval and uh, monies uh, that come from this uh, fund go towards helping with the twilight helping with uh, uh, fest and helping with the uh, 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 symphony that goes on downtown so you, you can see by the list there there's a, 
a wide uh, variety of uh, hot corners on here, a wide variety of um, events that uh, we're able to do for downtown and to bring people downtown and to um, 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 enjoy downtown. Uh, one thing that you might notice this year that's a little bit different is there's some monies also in here for uh, uh, about $6,400 for some uh, some banners downtown. Uh, if you'll notice the banners that are downtown uh, right now, they've lasted a good long time, about 10 years. And uh, it's uh, we've at the ADDA is a uh, has long since thought uh, uh, that it's uh, time for some some new banners, and we have since sent, sent out an RFP uh, to uh, request some lo local art proposals for how the new designs will work. Uh, so hopefully we'll keep, we will uh, the mayor who's on that board uh, with myself uh, will keep you posted on that. So hopefully we'll have some new banners uh, here soon. So uh, at any rate, I stand uh, ready to ask, answer some questions if you have any, but um, I'll go ahead and make a motion to uh, approve um, this request. Ms. Link. Um, th that RFP, how would one get a hold of that? I'd like to spread it around. Yes, that Commissioner Link. And I, I would suggest that if, if, if you have people in uh, your district who are interested and uh, uh, some artists around town to, uh, to contact Pamela at the, at the Downtown Development Authority. Okay. I also have some questions about um, ADDA sponsorship of events. It's come to my attention recently that um, basically it's against policy for an, an arts and crafts festival to take place downtown because it's considered a for-profit event. Um, and you know, if this festival were to be organized by a nonprofit, it would be okay. But the we're, we're not allowing these events if there's anyone who is actually for profit. Is that the case? You know, I don't know that that is the case, uh, Commissioner Link. I think there's uh, there's plenty of even nonprofits make a make some make some money to support their causes. But but I think I think in some issues uh, there may be some cases where where the petitioner may be asking to close the streets for for an extended for amount of time for special events for for an extended amount of time that may be above and beyond what we would typically do. Uh, so certainly, if you, if you have some, and I think I know who you're yeah. referring to. Yeah, you, I'd li I'd like to chat but, with you and readdress but, some of but this. But certainly, we also, uh, you know, we have, uh, as a matter of fact, the ADDA is on September. Uh, I wanted to mention this, so thank you for reminding me the opportunity to do this in this. On September the 13th of uh, a couple of weekends from now, it's on a Saturday. The AD the ADDA is sponsoring a um, a food truck festival. So uh, if if some of you remember. Uh, the last one we had a couple of years ago was very well attended, and uh, and it's uh, something I'm looking forward to. And, and uh, so, at any rate, we can work on that issue. Yeah, and, I'd like and to work with talk staff on it. figuring out what uh, situations. Yeah, that, yeah the that perception itself. that that all art should be nonprofit is is, is uh, I don't think it's very wise. These these craft fairs act as small business incubators, and and folks you know work hard on their arts and crafts, and and should be able to make a living off it whenever possible. Okay, we so have, I hope we can readdress that. We have a motion and a second. Mr. Neesmith. Uh, first of all, I'll be recusing myself from this vote because I do have a conflict of interest with one of the recipients. Uh, also, Mike, should not that, may I address Mike? Absolutely. Commissioner Hamby, should that sure. say FY16 right there? Commissioner Neesmith is correct. That should say FY16 under the proposed FY16C P budgets. It's always Commissioner Neesmith and Commissioner Harrod who find Herod, the yeah. Herod who find the uh, misprints, and uh, but it's good. We need we need we need commissioners who look for those things with those eagle eyes. Okay. Any further discussion before we vote? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. We go to item number six, which uh, are, is the lane configuration on North Chase Street and East Hancock Avenue, and uh, I believe Miss Link has a commission to find option. Yeah. Um, First of all, I want to thank everybody who's been so outspoken about this. Um, you know, we, we have a complete streets and road diet policy that vastly does not apply to most of our streets. Um, and so the, the fact that, you know, a, a meager little outside the loop section of Chase Street does warrant looking into for um, a road diet or complete streets allows us to actually be able to, to vote on this and, and allows me the opportunity per, to present this commission defined option. Um, so it's clear that that policy really needs to be readdressed and I hope that we can move forward with that very soon. Um, it shouldn't be this difficult to ensure the safety of 
our pedestrians and cyclists, especially on a road that goes through a, a neighborhood that is committed to biking and walking, a neighborhood that's adjacent to downtown, adjacent to the Prince Avenue business corridor, and a street that, that goes directly in front of a neighborhood school where one third of the children do bike or walk, um, and, a, and a street that is on our bike master plan. So. Um, I do hope that we can readdress that policy very, very soon, and, and hopefully that we can have a committee appointed that can look at these projects one by one as they come up. Other communities have these transportation boards that, um, you know, planning projects as well as transportation projects go before, and they have a citizen committee that evaluates. Um, we just came from Chapel Hill, and, and their projects all have to go before a transportation board. So um, I hope that we can move forward and, and make real progress towards um, actual safety for our pedestrians and cyclists in our community. Um, so with that in mind, I'd like to propose this commission to find option that we remove item C regarding Chase Street and delay the repaving to fiscal year 17 to allow athens Clark County Transportation and Public Works staff the opportunity to conduct analysis of the entire road from Newton Bridge Dairy Pack to Prince Avenue and to fully engage the public in the planning and design process to incorporate appropriate traffic calming and bike and pedestrian infrastructure improvements along the entire corridor. And we should go ahead and improve items A and B regarding East Hancock and Riverbend Parkway. I have a motion and second. Is there any discussion? Mr. Hamby? Questions and, and sure. certainly this is something I, I, I will be glad to support. I do have a, a, just a, a few specific questions. Uh, regarding, uh, I understand that this paving will take place uh, the following fiscal year. So, does that give an opportunity for another street to to move up on on the uh, on the list? Uh, yes, it would, and it would be something we'd want to do because the primary source of this funding are state funds that are granted on a yearly basis. Therefore, if you don't use them, then you don't get to carry them forward. Them them, yeah. So we certainly will bring forth the next street that is in the um, evaluation list that you have seen in the past that meets the criteria in terms of needing to be resurfaced. The next street that also has similar funding need, and that would be the next one that would go on the list. Okay, okay. And certainly with regards to this issue, I would, I would, I would argue that uh, the public input, and, and certainly Commissioner Link have helped, uh, bring this uh, bring this to our attention. You know, normally our policy is to look at look at um, uh, uh, the bike lanes as they exist when we repave it. And my question to staff is this: is you know, this is some something a little bit different. So, will um, is the analysis? You know, is that something staff is is? I'm sure they are. I just want to make sure that. that as I read probably the motion, wouldn't have to hire a consultant or something to go no. do this. As I read the motion, what I think our um, task would be would be to analyze the sections that are noted in the motion, the two termini points being Dairy Pack um, and Prince Avenue, uh, to determine if there are other uh, lane configurations or other safety um, issues that could be brought to bear on that particular part of the roadway. But I want to clearly note this. This is a resurfacing project, and therefore the analysis would not involve relocation of curb lines, additional rights away, or relocation of utilities. That is a much bigger project, much more expensive project, and one I'm assuming we're not being asked to do. Uh, we're simply going to be working within the restraints of the existing curb lines. With, with that, uh, with the follow up to that question now, if, if when you come back with the analysis, you'll probably have some costs associated with doing that. And if we decide to move in that direction, it's something we can. Yes, we can find that, that would be a future project that, if you wish to give directions to us to analyze that further and you identify some funding for that, we certainly could provide that information. Okay. Interestingly enough, I had a conversation with a with a friend of mine who I actually worked for who owned a place over on Dairy Pack Road, so I would travel that uh, road quite a bit. And uh, the conversation this morning, he had read about it in the paper, and the conversation this morning, he commented, and he usually doesn't comment on political things, but he commented on this one um, because it was in the paper, and he, of course, had a, had a business down there, that that street has, you know, changed quite a bit, and he had, had that business, and I haven't worked at this business for, for quite a number of years, but uh, certainly the how that street is being utilized has changed. So I'm, I'm interested to see how this analysis plays out. And 
I do want to make it clear that this is not asking for a reconstruction of the street and changing curb lines. There are plenty of guidelines out there that can direct you how to implement bike infrastructure, um, you know, changing lane widths. Um, the Federal Highway Administration has a, a, a new guideline out there. Um, and, and, you know, there's videos online um, that, that can show you exactly, you know, what your street looks like now and what it can look like to incorporate those lanes. So it's, it's not rocket science, and there's plenty of information that's extremely accessible to offer options and, and initiate a discussion about what the people who live and work along this street want to see. Mr. Lee Smith. Yes, sir. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I think this is an example of why we decided to have an objective to have a complete street ordinance this year is that a complete the, the model complete streets ordinances would require that this kind of study be done without us having to discuss it and hold it. It would be a part of the process, at least the good model ordinances that I've looked at. So I hope we can move forward with working on that ordinance uh, as we said we would. I'm just going to make a quick comment for clarification because I'm very glad that, that Ms. Lincoln our, and our manager clarified what we're looking at because I didn't want people to assume that a year from now that we're going to be changing sidewalks and changing curb lines because that's a very expensive process and our biggest limitation is right away uh, and our next biggest limitation is money and uh, something that will be coming up within the next few months uh, that we'll be talking about is the T-splost. Uh, which is something Mr. Hamby refers to a lot. He's spent all those those dollars two or three times by now, I think. We'll, we'll uh, yeah. But but if if the community decides uh, to support that, that will give us uh, some dollars that we can do some things with that we have not been able to do in the past. But I I, I just want to make sure that that the people that live in that area are understanding that we're still talking about a resurfacing and re restriping uh, of the street, not a major change in it. So. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Do we have any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, great. Thank you, guys. Um, we're, we're now to uh, item number seven, which is um, – give me just a minute because I want to make sure that I know what we're, we're looking at here. Okay, item number seven, which is the business card improvements. Sorry, that's the one – um, I'm trying to decide if this, if this is in anybody's particular district. Mike. Oh, oh, okay. I've got it back now. Okay, this this is our downtown uh, infrastructure. Thanks. And I know there's certainly a lot of interest in this issue amongst all the commissioners. So I, I, I as you know, I just sort of happened to raise my hand first, but but I do want to uh, say just a few things about this. This has uh, been a splice project that we've had on hold. I think since uh, 2004, and certainly the the Washington uh, or the rather the City Hall streetscape thing has been on hold uh, since then as well. 2005, it looks like uh, for that as well. 2005 for the business street, and actually 2000 since uh, for the City Hall streetscape. So these have been on hold for a while, and as uh, as we can see based on this, you know we have four and a half million dollars allocated towards this project. We received one bid of about $12 million. Uh, as you can see, some costs have gone up <laughs> since this has uh, come, in, come into play, which suggests to me that we're obviously going to have to do some rethinking about this project and maybe find some, some new ways to do uh, what it is that this is intended to do. It's intended to help fix some of the infrastructure downtown downtown so that uh, you know we hear a lot of, we hear several complaints about some areas of downtown that have the the, the stale beer smell so we want to make sure to be able to fix that uh, and and do some things such as this but I'd also remind you too that some of this money we've used to help pay for some of the uh, uh, new parking meters that we have downtown so the money's meant to fix some infrastructure and it's meant to help improve the sidewalks of downtown a lot of the sidewalks as you have, have probably noticed are, are uh, being warped by the trees and the tree roots so this will help with that so at any rate we're obviously not going to accept the bid i hope of 12 million dollars just because we don't know where that money would come from 
but I think it does allow us an opportunity to stay, take a step back and, and, and probably prioritize what it is in, these, in this project uh, that, we, that needs to move to the top so that we can get some of it done and maybe find, a, find a, a, another uh, option for uh, helping fund the rest. So uh, at any rate, I'm going to go ahead and make a motion to uh, reject the bid. And, I'll, uh, I'll second. Okay. I, have, I have a few comments as well. Um, when this project went through the design phase two years, over two years ago now, um, I was paying very close attention. I wasn't on the commission, but I, I went to those input sessions. And um, downtown has changed a lot in the past two years. We now have, you know, a couple thousand students living downtown. Um, there was a user group that contributed input on this design process. Um, but I don't believe that user group in included or considered residents of downtown, the, st the uses that students would use. So I, I really believe that this project needs to go back to the design phase for some tweaking to consider the kind of uses that student residents of downtown need. Um, and also to look at this in regards to the downtown master plan. This project was designed outside of the downtown master plan um, before the downtown master plan really got started. And um, we really need to take a holistic look at, at our restreetscaping and at least come up with some, you know, broad ideas of what we're going to do about implementing bike lanes, which direction they'll go in, which street they'll go on. Um, I was riding on the Health Sciences bus last week um, and I, on Prince Avenue, down Prince Avenue, and I watched a young co-ed ride in her bike right alongside the bus and she turned onto Pulaski Street where we have a bike lane. And she obviously was no longer quite as nervous. She rode all the way along. We got to Broad Street. She got off her bike. She pushed it across the crosswalk, lifted it up, put it onto the, the sidewalk, and pushed it up Broad Street. If we had some bike infrastructure downtown on our downtown street, she might have been more likely to go ahead and cut through downtown and maybe stop for a coffee along the way. Um, you know, when you do get bike lanes through your retail corridors, your retail sales go up up to 50%. Um, they can be a real economic driver for, for business corridors. So I hope that we can, you know, have some plan for where we're going to put that infrastructure. At this point, we have a greenway, which is a fabulous uh, cycling facility, and we have a, a Firefly Trail, a rail trail that's coming online in the foreseeable future. Um, but there's no way to get there from the neighborhoods where people do want to walk and bike from your Prince Avenue neighborhoods, Normaltown, Boulevard, Cobham, Hancock. Um, you know, and, and an afternoon cycling on the Greenway is a great thing to do with your family, but I don't know anybody that would allow their child to cycle through downtown, and it is illegal to push your bike on the sidewalk. So whatever happens with this particular project, I hope we can take a step back and, and make sure that we know exactly where we're going with incorporating bike infrastructure into downtown. Thank, thank you, Ms. Lincoln. We have a motion and a second. Do you mind if I just Not at all. Um, and, and I just want to remind everybody that this project is, is just for Clayton Street. So we're just talking about Clayton Street and around City Hall uh, with the streetscape. And, uh, and certainly I think what our next step ought to be is to, is to take a look at what those components of this project um, are and that we put out the bid and see, see what it is we can afford at the end of the day. And uh, from, from that standpoint, I think, I think looking at that, that type of um, infrastructure from that standpoint would be good. And just as a side note, that, you know, from, from, the bike, uh, from the Bike Athens folks that I've spoken with, and perhaps I haven't heard this correctly, but their focus has always been, like it has been on Chase Street for the complete streets, but also in, in bringing people to downtown. Once you get to downtown, yeah, there's there's other ways to to go about moving around. Certainly, Clayton Street is a three three lane road. So, at any rate, I just you know just want to make sure everybody's aware that this is only just Clayton Street that this Plaza project is is referring to, and the next step I hope will uh, be uh, perhaps staff can refresh us on the components of this of this uh, project, and we can decide what we can afford and go from there. Well, some of the most important part of this work is below grade. Yeah that we'll never see, but we'll, we'll realize the effects of. And your motion in a second is going to give Mr. Reddish the opportunity to uh, do a $12 million project with $4, $4 million. So I'm looking forward to your suggestions, Mr. Reddish. <laughs> Y'all ready to vote? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? OK. 
Okay. Um, item number eight is our Clark County Jail Inmate Telephone um, Services contract. Would anyone like to open that discussion or make a motion? Ms. I'll Link. open it. I have a hard time supporting anything that's going to profit off of folks in prison. Um, so I won't be supporting this. Ms. Terrett. I do have a question. Maybe the manager, because I agree with the comment from the, the floor that there does seem to be something a little bit distasteful about making a quarter of a million dollars off phone calls from inmates at the, at the jail. So, Mr. Manager, could you maybe talk us through a little bit about how this would work? I mean, if we were to say we didn't want to accept that money, I mean, how does that, how is this contract structured with the company that is um, that, that the proposal is here to work with? Can First, we just I would give tell it back? You, I mean, if we say we don't want that $250,000, does that just go into their pocket, or how does all that work? No. Uh, first, let me tell you, this is a process and an approach providing telephone service for inmates throughout the country. This is not something that we've just started doing. It has been in place for a long time, even in our current jail. Uh, the way the process works is there's typically a vendor who makes a proposal, and that's what you see in your agenda report here. And once that vendor is chosen, then they provide all the capital costs of installing the system and maintaining the system. Uh, it's important for us in terms of our jail about to be able to, uh, is almost ready to come online. We're expecting that's going to be happening somewhere around the 1st of November. So this is one of the last components that has to be put in place before we can move the inmates in. Once the uh, system is in place, there is a, uh, a cost that the a vendor charges for the calls and they receive a portion of that and we receive the rest of it. Our portion is $250,000. Theirs is less than that, if I remember this correctly. Um, it is typically not paid by the inmate themselves, although it, I guess it could be, but if you've ever received a call from a correctional institute, you're given a recording for the very beginning that tells you where it's coming from and there's a cost attached to that. Uh, part of that is to control the, um, inmates, I guess you would suggest, overusing the phone, calling on a regular basis, places that don't wish to be connected to a correctional institute. Um, if you elect not to go this process, this, uh, this uh, manner, then that's $250,000 of revenue to operate the jail that you'll have to make up some other way. But you don't have to have this kind of program. If you just want to put a system in at no charge, you've got the capital cost plus the reduction of revenue of $250,000. Yes. Like motion to accept, uh, accept the, um, accept the um, okay. selection for this RFP. Have a, do we have, have a second? second. Okay. Mr. Mr. Neesmith, something. you wanted to make a comment? Yes. Uh, Manager Reddish, did I understand, I think this is true, that all those calls are collect calls? Typically, yes. Typically, it's a collect call, if, whether they're calling their attorney or a family member. Correct. Okay. So, so it's not generally coming out of the pocket of the inmate. No. And, and we would probably, I'm sure we haven't thought about this much since this has been going on for so long and it's a general practice. It would probably be pretty expensive for us to install and manage our own phone system. I know a little bit about that. In fact, I know it would be expensive for us to do that, uh, but we, we haven't really haven't looked at that, have we? No, we have not actually done an evaluation of cost for us to put our own system in and operate it again. This is pretty standard practice, and it's practice that we've been following in this community for many years. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else want to discuss yeah. this? I just want to offer that uh, the jail is one of the most expensive operations we run in the county, and it is supported entirely with... Um, general fund dollars, which is mostly tax dollars, property tax dollars, sales tax dollars. So, I mean, you can argue this helps to offset those costs. Yes. Ms. Bratton, would you call the roll for us, please? Hamby? Yes. Bale? Yes. Herod? Yes. Dickerson? Yes. Sims? Yes. Link? No. Wright? Yes. Bailey? Yes. Neesmith? Yes. Okay. Eight yes, one no. Thank you. Uh, before we move on to item 9 and 10, which are related 
I want to just uh, give a reminder to our commissioners that we really don't need to discuss the pros and cons of these particular sites tonight. Uh, what we're doing is just allowing our site selection committee to move forward with the uh, technical and cost evaluations for these um, these particular sites that they have identified as, as potential sites for these uh, two operations, and they'll be coming back to us uh, for for us to actually choose or discard sites. Uh, Mr. Hamby. Sure. Uh, if you want me to go ahead and discuss. We, we, well, we, we'll, we'll do them one at a time since they're one at a time sure. on you. We'll start with nine, okay. so, which okay. is quite an extension. Thank you. And we certainly had a lot of discussion on this at the last meeting, so I won't take up too much of your time. We certainly talked about the pros and cons of each issue, of each site, rather. And Commissioner Wright was very helpful in, in helping uh, make this uh, option that I'm about to make. So I hope you support it, and I hope you will see that, uh, that it does in, in, encompass, encompass us to uh, look at the sites uh, that are being recommended, but and 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 I know we were asked to trim it down a little bit, but I think by the um, interest that this uh, particular project has generated and the economic development that it's going to bring to wherever it goes, and I think it will, um, and I, I'm I'm glad we're able to utilize SPLOS dollars that allow people to go to a certain area and, and participate in events and and whatnot. So, uh, with that interest in mind, um, I'd like to make a motion. Uh, along with Commissioner Wright to, let me pull it up here, to um, to make a motion to accept uh, every, every um, location on Amendment 1 with the exception of the research drive uh, selection. So Amendment 1 will remove the uh, 562 research drive area and replace it with the 266, 2665 Lexington Road, which is a site that is owned by the county and it's next to the airport. So this will allow us to look at all the, the sites that certainly um, um, folks that utilize the corporate extensions have an interest in and some and folks behind the rail have an interest in, in seeing how it can benefit some other areas. Um, and we'll analyze these sites, ask staff to do that, and let the chips fall where they may to see where to see who comes out on top. So I'll make that motion. Okay, we have a motion, a substitute motion on. Well, actually, it's the first motion because uh, it's not a substitute. Yeah. Um, it's a commission defined option, I would assume. Yeah. So, so we have a motion on the floor. Does everybody understand what it is? Basically, it's removing one, Could, one item we, and. Madam Mayor, I've got a question. What page number is? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'd like. Let me see here. Sixty-four. Okay. That's where the amendment one is. Actually, Amendment 1 is on page 62 of my, my iPad here. Okay. I, it's called Attachment 1 in this. That's what you're referring to? Okay, That's I saw correct. that. I was looking for Amendment 1. All right. Thank you. Attachment. I'm sorry. That's it should have been problem. Attachment. I just want to make sure. No problem. All right. Everybody understand what the vote is? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. We'll go on to item number 10, uh, which is the Fire Protection Services uh, location. Any discussion on that one? Mr. Neesmith. Smith, um, I've thought long and hard about this, and I think I, I think I want to go ahead and make a motion that we uh, accept all of these sites except for Commerce Boulevard. Take that off the map. I think that's just not a good place for a fire station because of traffic issues and signalization. So I'd like to make a motion that we accept this list, but eliminate 299 Commerce mm -hmm. Boulevard. Okay, I have a motion. I second that motion. I have a motion and a second. Any, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Now we go to item number 11, the Downtown Master Plan Committee recommendations. And Mr. Hamby chairs that committee, so would you like to start the discussion? Yes, ma'am. I'll be glad to. Uh, as you all know, we talked about this quite a bit at, their, at our last meeting, and I'd just uh, like to point out that also uh, Commissioner Sims, uh, Commissioner Link, Commissioner Wright, and Commissioner Bell, and Commissioner Gert uh, serve with me on this committee. And the committee talked about these two items. And uh, basically these two items, one is to look at a crosswalk uh, on Broad Street that, as you know, there's a crosswalk at the at the arches right now, and we're looking at a crosswalk on the other side, which is which is in front of uh, Starbucks. And uh, what this uh, option does is to 
ask staff to uh, do what they need to do with GDOT and develop some sort of concept and cost associated with doing this and whether or not GDOT would actually give us approval to do this. So all those questions will be answered. And we needed to take this step at this at the commission level because, you know, certainly the committee can't direct staff to, to go and, and do do this work. And it's it's important that every commissioner gets to weigh in on this as well because it you know, certainly affects downtown. So um, so staff will go look into this and come back to us after they've done the concept and after they've had discussions with GDOT. And we will determine at that point in time uh, whether or not what staff brings back to us is, is realistic and they'll tell us whether or not it is and uh, move forward from there as to whether or not we will do it. So we'll vote on moving forward. We're just taking a look at it from staff at this point in time and coming back with a vote as to whether or not we want to do it. And the same applies to the to the Newton Bridge, uh, I'm sorry, Newton Road, <laughs> Newton Road uh, uh, component as well. I'd like to point out, and 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 we've seen this on the Downtown Master Plan Committee, that part of a theme that's come out of the Master Plan, and and one that I appreciate is is that uh, Professor Crowley and the, and the citizens that he's that he's engaged have suggested that downtown. Uh, look at expanding their boundaries, so this is why uh, this one's on there, but also uh, look at how we can create uh, a little bit more open space for people to gather, uh, sit and eat and talk and, and, and do, some, do some good things uh, together. And, uh, and so this allows for a component of that open space. Again, at the end of the day, we're not voting on whether or not that open space is going to happen today or not. We're asking staff to go and take a look at it. And staff will also engage uh, the people who will be impacted by it the most. Certainly, the folks in Bottle Works and the, and the businesses there uh, will have a will have a very um, uh, uh, good say in, in how we approach this. And so, it just helps us answer some questions on the on the committee level, and uh, I hope you'll support us at least moving forward with it to see to see what results come back to us. So, thank you. Is that motion move forward? With yes, ma'am. Okay. I'd like to propose a second, second a substitute motion. That. Well, we oh, had a second sorry. by Miss Wright. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'd like to propose a, a substitute motion that, in addition to asking staff to do the analysis for the closure of Newton Street. Um, that we also ask them to do the analysis on that entire block of prints to look at traffic calming and proper pedestrian and bike infrastructure on that entire last downtown block of prints. Um, as you heard tonight, there's going to be opposition from property owners to the closure of Newton Street. It serves as a, um, you know, a direct uh, route into the parking lot of the Bottle Works. Um, we're going to see two very large scale, very dense developments right there. Um, at the Bottle Works and at the St. Joseph's property um, proposed in the near future and we're going to need to get ahead of that ball and make sure that we do something about the actual issue which is the speeding traffic on Prince Avenue. Um, the, I talked to Jack Crowley, he said in our meeting that the reason for proposing the closure of Newton Street for a cafe was to get diners off the sidewalk away from the speeding traffic on Prince Avenue. and. That is the issue at hand. We, we need to deal with the speeding traffic at, on Prince Avenue. And we should have an option. When, when we're presented with this Newton Street closure, we should have an option for what we can do to address the actual problem when it, if, if it's found out that it's not a viable option. And I think that we will see that you know we're going to see some opposition from people who will be directly negatively impacted by such a closure. I have a motion. Is there a second? <laughs> We have a motion second, Mr. And Mayor. I'd all like to make a comment. Um, you know, this is this is the substitute motion is, is news to me, and I'm sure news to the committee. What this purpose of the committee is is to look at the downtown master plan recommendations. And sure, there's a lot of things in this recommendations that are that certainly can be impacted by other things. But this is a simple request coming from the committee to help us move forward with a concept. And certainly, certainly, I can appreciate. Uh, looking at Prince Avenue. I think we ought to look at Prince Avenue, but I don't think we ought to. Uh, this the part of this master plan was calling for some some uh, space uh, to to allow for some diners to eat at, and and certainly I think it would probably make it safer for <laughs> for Prince Avenue to to allow that, and for the diners. Others may disagree, but we can certainly look at the concept when that comes back and do that. And 
and, and Commissioner Link, I, with all due respect, I think it's going to make it hard for us to bring stuff back to this full body uh, and with, with surprises like this because what we're looking at is what's in the master plan, the downtown master plan. And certainly the opening up the discussion to Prince Avenue can come at a, diff at a different point in time. But what I'm asking for today and, and what the committee members voted unanimously to do was to bring these two items back. Uh, that are asking, uh, as a matter of fact, Commissioner Link wrote <laughs> part of this agenda. So what we're asking for is to approve this agenda as it's written. Thank you. Mr. Neesmith. I certainly see both sides of this, Commissioner Link's and Commissioner Hamby's. Uh, the problem is that when will we have another opportunity to address Prince Avenue in this right here in this this particular location, which is not a state road. And, and so I, I see that what's happening here is that Commissioner Link, Link is trying to seize an opportunity that we don't know when it's going to come back. We don't know when we're going to be able to make such a motion, when there's going to be something on the agenda that allows us to. And so I'm going to have to support her motion. Okay. Any, before you, anybody else wish to speak? Mr. I, I would imagine that there's probably going to be a lot of opportunities come back before this because certainly Prince Avenue has been a lot of discussion here lately. We have a work session that's coming up that will address some, uh, some pedestrian safety issues. We've directed staff to look at the list of those pedestrian issues and pedestrian streets where we have the most, most uh, reoccurring incidences. And I think we're actually having that uh, within the month or two. But the other component of it is, I do believe that uh, when if a, when a citizens committee is formed, if if that's moving in, the, if that's the direction we're moving in, that there certainly will be opportunities for for uh, residents along Prince Avenue, uh, not unlike people who go before Splos to 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 uh, argue for some projects to go on a Splos list. There probably would be some opportunities for residents along Prince Avenue to also argue for some T-SPLOS dollars to help us make the improvements that we all want to make. But what I'm suggesting is, for this particular issue, let's get staff to move forward on these two items that were within the downtown master plan, which was the charge of this committee. Ms. Wright, you want to say something? Oh, yeah, I'm in support of the initial motion um, and this topic that came from the um, committee. I, I don't think that when the plan comes forward and we look at it and it talks about closing vehicle traffic to that small section of Newton, if you can't visualize that that's going to improve traffic on Prince by not having people stopping to turn left into there or the increased traffic of vehicles turning right into there, um, this is covering some safety issues that are over there. So it's not completely void of that and um, I do appreciate the need for Prince to be getting the attention that it's long overdue um, but um, I'm not in favor of us trying to piggyback that onto this topic at this time. Thank you Ms. Roberts. I'd like to add I, I support the initial um, recommendation mainly because it looks like there's been plenty of time for this to come forward and it hasn't and I don't like getting blindsided like this so I mean I think Prince Avenue needs its attention but this is maybe not the time or the place to deal with it so. Thank you Ms. Dickerson. Ms. Bell. Uh, I would like to support the initial uh, proposal. The amended would dilute what we worked so hard on that committee, the progress that we've made, and there's time later for that to be addressed, but this will give solution to some of the things that we've talked a great deal about, and that was that area where this is proposed. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay, we have a substitute motion and second on the floor. Uh, would you a roll call vote for us, Ms. Pratlin? Link? Yes. Wright? No. Bailey? Yes. Neesmith? Yes. Hamby? No. Bale? No. Herod? No. Dickerson? No. Sims? No. Okay. Three yes, six no. Okay, we'll go back to our original motion. Uh, would you do a roll call for us on that one, please? Hamby? Yes. Bale? Yes. Herod? Yes. Dickerson? Yes. Sims? Yes. Link? No. Wright? Yes. Bailey? Yes. Neesmith? Yes. Great. Eight yes, one no. Thank you. Uh, we'll now go to our public hearing and deliberation on recommendations from the Clark County Planning Commission. Uh, and I mentioned earlier that uh, there's a little different procedure here. And do we have, um, starting with item number 12, um, we, don't have, we don't have anyone for the 10-minute sessions on item number 12. So anyone that wishes to speak to... Um, the request of Ella Clark for uh, the 
use of, in an RS district residence, um, a proposed individual personal care home, this would be the time to come to the podium and speak to us about it. Any speakers on this one? Okay, we'll come behind the rail. I believe this is Mr. Sims. District. Madam Mayor, as we discussed uh, earlier, uh, I think, like I said, I think I have more personal care homes in my district than any other place, and I don't see this being a problem for anyone, and I will make a motion that we approve the recommendation coming from the Planning Commission to approve the personal care home at uh, 527 uh, Arch Street. Do we have a second? Okay. Mr. Bearman, do we have an ordinance? In the Code of Athens, Clark County, Georgia, with respect to special use approval in the RS5 single family residential district on the approximate, <clears throat> approximate 0 0.187 acre parcel of land located at 527 Odd Street and for other purposes. Okay. Uh, any discussion before we vote? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. We'll go to item number 13, which is um, the request of Carrie Halperin. Uh, as an agent for Halpern Enterprises, Chick-fil-A, Walmart, uh, and its proposal uses for the uh, out parcels in front of that Walmart um, complex over on Lexington Road, basically. Um, and this is uh, in Ms. Dickerson's district. Um, but we'll have, is there any public comment on it before we come behind the rail? Okay, seeing none, do we have an ordinance, Mr. Behrman? Yes, an ordinance to amend the Code of Athens, Clark County, Georgia, with respect to amending the existing plan development zoned CGPD, Commercial General Plan Development, on the approximate 34 acre tract of land comprised of five parcels of land at 4365, 4375, 4405, and 4425 Lexington Road, and for other purposes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Ms. Mayor Ms. Dickerson. I would like to ask that we hold this item until next month. Um, at our voting meeting, Commissioner Heron and I met with uh, Mr. Halpern last Friday, and we are wanting to work on some wording a little bit to, um, along with planning staff, to further protect um, that development, but also allow for orientation towards Lexington Road. So we're going to work on it, and we'll get back with you. Okay. We have a second. second. We have a motion and second. Uh, any to further discussion before we vote? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. We'll go to item number fourteen. And we, 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 this is our public input portion, and we do have um, some folks that have signed up pro and con. Uh, the, the pros always uh, go first, and Mr. Jared York has signed up for the 10-minute uh, portion on this item. Is Mr. York here? Gene, I don't see him. Okay, I, I don't I don't see the the citizen who signed up for the 10 minute um, uh, pro argument for this uh, position. We have um, two people that have signed up in opposition to it for the 10 minute section, uh, which will share it. Um, uh, Marie Braveheart dances. We'll have four minutes, and uh, Ellen Roshsheimer. I'm not sure I'm saying it right. Um, we'll we'll have six, but if Miss Braveheart would come dance dances would come forward. To our honored mayor and commissioners, I am Mari Braveheart Dances and I live at 406 Springdale Street, adjacent to the three acres of old growth hardwoods Jared York wants to rezone. First, thank you for exploring in depth the proposed rezoning of that property. A primary concern of those of us who oppose the rezoning is that this is a bait and switch development one which starts out with an aging in place agenda and ends up with students living there instead. But there's a bigger picture this situation implicates that this commission must see in order to make the right decision. Certainly attracting quality businesses to our city is desirable. Certainly want, we want more and better jobs for our residents, and certainly we want the local businesses we already have, like Terrapin Brewery, among others, to stay put. But does achieving those important goals necessitate sacrifices in other areas, like the environment, the character of our city, and growing a sense of community? I and many others resoundingly say no. I'm not a commissioner or the mayor or even an armchair lawyer. 
that tree ordinance y'all passed is a bit daunting. So I'm not going to stand here and try to give you a primer on how legislation should be structured to grow the city's businesses while at the same time protecting the intangibles that have landed Athens on many a best places to live list of late. <coughs> but of course policy minutia is not the entirety of your jobs. What I, a resident of Athens since the early 1970s, observe nowadays, and it didn't used to be this way, is that seemingly everywhere I drive in Athens, I see clear cutting, both on public and private land. I'm neither idealistic nor naive. I understand trees have to be cut down when land is being developed. But I and many others also understand that wanton clear cutting and unnecessary removal of very large and old trees is nothing more than cost cutting at the expense of those intangibles, environment, character, and community that I mentioned earlier. <coughs> Athens needs its trees and it needs its businesses. It can't be Athens without both, or if it's propelled primarily by one or the other. We need a bigger vision for our community. It costs a change of thinking, perhaps a change of heart. Athens, without question, is the dogs, UGA, music, the arts, and the bar scene. It's the Human Rights Festival. It's Athfest. It's Cedar versus Central. It's where is Bruno going to put the next iteration of Caliente Cab? But it's also a 38% poverty rate in school system that even with the superintendent of the year must improve. Strengthening those attributes while simultaneously eliminating those weaknesses requires both business and development, and yes, the proverbial trees, or in this case, real live breathing trees. Without that balance, without that vision, Athens loses its heart. It is only in balancing the scales between being pro-business and development and in, with being pro-environment that Athens can ever be known as a truly classic and classy city. Those of us who live in Athens, precious and historic in-town neighborhoods do not want dense infill housing in our neighborhoods. We want more green spaces in town, not less, and we want mature hardwood trees to be protected instead of being cut down at the rate they are. Aging in place is a good concept, but should not come at the expense of homeowners in the neighborhood. And at the end of the day, to get this decision right, this commission should deny Mr. York's zoning request. Thank you for your time. Thank you, ma'am. Um, and Miss L Ellie, <laughs> and if you will pronounce your name for me. Ellie Lester Roshan Zamir. Professor Emerita, Grady College, UGA, and this is my husband, Saeed. We live at 375 Springdale Street since 2001. Our driveway is an extension of Rock Springs, and our house is opposite the property, which in turn is at that T inter intersection of Springdale and Rock Springs. We've spoken with neighbors and affected property owners and believe our concerns echo what others have expressed. Our request that the sought rezoning of the property be denied. I'll outline our reasons. Existing infrastructure, including traffic and drain sewer, are too congested for proposed rezoning. Currently, traffic and pedestrian flows are constricted due to heavy use, ever-increasing traffic, that problematic and confusing T intersection, frequent speeding, and street is parking lot each of which hinders safety and tax infrastructures, both traffic related and those related to water and sewer. The T intersection floods with any steady rainfall. The pipes are old and overburdened. On street parking on both Springdale Street and Rock Springs is currently heavily used. Rock Springs is already narrowed by existing on street parking and Springdale, uh, including opposite that property is occupied daily. Um, Springdale from Millage to beyond Rock Springs, traveling west, is essentially a parking place for students and folks who work at some nearby shops and professional offices. Traffic flows from Baxter to Rock Springs to Springdale and from Millage to Springdale to Rock Springs is already heavy. Springdale and Rock Springs 
are used as a cut through in attempts to avoid congestion and to avoid the larger intersection of Millage and Baxter Streets. Also, the two existing apartment develops, developments within a couple of blocks of the property produce their own steady stream of traffic and pedestrians. Now, regarding this specific proposed development and the claim to market to senior citizens wishing to age in place, vague plans are radically different from selling to that group. Senior citizen is an elastic term. Aging in place suggests from middle, late middle age to elderly. There is probably only one way to ensure buyers of that described demographic, an age restriction on buyers and required owner occupancy. Specific amenities are always included in developments that successfully attract older buyers who want to nurture a home from late middle age onwards. Indoors, those include widened doorways, elevated toilet seats, built-in grab bars, single floor living, and so forth. Outdoors, those typically include enlarged green areas with places to congregate. For example, small gazebos with sitting and gathering, for sitting and gathering, walking paths. Note that the sidewalks at our end of the neighborhood end at that property, from Millage to that property. The adjacent neighborhood streets do not have sidewalks. Marketing is not enough to attract in, in a age in place demographic. For example, as currently conceived equally, parents could consider these properties as desirable for their student children with the advantage of being a long-term investment opportunity. There is nothing inherent in this property, indoors or out, or planned pricing for that matter, that would deter such a use. So our request that rezoning be denied, we urge that a use for the property be developed within the legal requirements of the current zoning. There are endemic problems with this specific proposed development, but in any case, we are against rezoning the property, which will overburden existing infrastructures and undermine the integrity of the neighborhood. Thank you for your time. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, I'm not sure, but I believe that um, that Mr. York walked in just about time. The other lady starts speaking, so you can have your 10 minutes now. Um, my name is Jared York, and I live at 497 West Rutherford Street in Athens, Georgia. Uh, the first thing I want to do tonight is thank Bob Smith at Smith Planning Group and Katrina Evans at E&E &E Architecture, who did a wonderful job on, on this project. Um, I think everybody who uh, has seen their drawings and renderings and, and site plans and things were, uh, were, were very pleased with our work, and I know I was. Um, I also want to thank the members of the Planning Commission uh, who, took a, who took the time to really look at this project. Uh, recognized its merits and ultimately made a recommendation for approval. I also want to thank the people uh, who uh, have, have spoken out in favor of this project. Um, it hasn't been an easy thing to do in our neighborhood and I, I really want to thank those people who, who spoke their mind. Um, I think we all know where the Villas at Springdale project is heading this evening, um, but I did want to address a, a few aspects of the project and the process uh, that I've just been through. Uh, with over 110,000 people living in our community currently, we are down to less than 80 single family permits per year in our county. Uh, we currently have a lack of several types of housing within our community, uh, including housable, housing suitable to seniors, housing available to anyone with special needs, housing available to anyone who wants to live in town and not have a yard or an old home to take care of, affordable housing, and the list goes on. The list of needs in housing in Athens is long. I'm very hopeful that the uh, workforce housing study that you guys have commissioned uh, will highlight some of those needs and also hopefully ways that those needs can ultimately be met in our community. Um, over the course of the approval process of this project, I've heard two main concerns with the villas at Springdale. Um, those main concerns have been student housing and density. Um, and in terms of student housing, this has been the main concern we have heard throughout the process from day one. Uh, I think we've done an excellent job of mitigating the risk of this project becoming student housing uh, through price point, bed bath parity, unit design, binding HOA covenant language, the right mix of amenities, and the obvious intent of the project. There are a few other successful in-town developments that have used these same methods uh, of keeping owner occupants in their homes, uh, and Carlton Terrace is a shining example of that. Uh, the other item um, that uh, uh, has been a main concern of, of people has been density. 
Um, we are currently asking for a density of 14 units on 3.2 acres. 14 units sounds like a lot of units. We don't have very many in-town developments that are 14 units. Uh, but I think the key that a lot of people are missing here is it's on 3.2 acres. It's not 14 units on one acre. Um, all of our current RS5 in-town neighborhoods and most of our RS8 neighborhoods in town have existing density sitting on the ground higher than what we're asking for on this parcel. Um, with density surrounding the property of commercial sitting to our north, 13.74 units per acre on the immediate property to our west, 5.34 units per acre on the immediate property to our right, we're asking for 4.3 units per acre um, on this property. Um, the other thing is the traditional neighborhood designation in the future development guide describes this property to a T. And then it suggests density for such a prop property up to six units per acre. We're asking for 4.3 units per acre. Um, I do understand that it sounds like a lot um, when you step back and look at the project, but if you look at what's around it and you look at the, the simple numbers around it, um, that's not too much density for that property. Uh, the Villas at Springdale would be an anchor type of project that would be able to stand on its own and bridge the commercial aspects of Baxter Street with the residential neighborhood of Five Points. It would be like taking a smaller, less dense, and nicer version of Carlton Terrace and putting it on the corner of Rock Springs and Springdale. I think it would encourage the trend towards more owner occupants in the area and overall be a great asset for the community. Many people have cited that they do not want to take the risk that the villas at Springdale will not be successful or that the intended owner occupants will not come and ultimately students will live in the community. The problem with risk is that when you take none, you end up with less than ordinary results. I think the villas at Springdale is an extraordinary project and as a neighbor and the developer, I feel it's worth it. I want to thank you for your time this evening and for your consideration with the project. Thank you, Mr. York. And anyone else that wishes to speak to this, uh, come forward. And I, I think we've got quite a few people want to speak, so if y'all would kind of queue up, it would help. Yeah. I'm sorry, Madam Mayor, are we in opposition? No, it, 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 it's, you can just speak how, in whatever way you want to now, but, but we're now limited to three minutes. Yeah. Mr. Smith. Good evening, Madam Mayor. Uh, I was attending uh, the session, uh, the non-voting session two weeks ago. I had already heard about this issue. Uh, I was supporting the complete streets. And I've thought about this issue a lot because uh, Commissioner Hamby raised an important question. When you ask for something from the community, shouldn't you give something back? And, and I listened to that, and I was wondering about this aging in place and the criteria for aging in place because at some point we have to trust uh, our elected officials to a degree when there seems to be a wide consensus that something as important as aging in place is not, uh, has not been accepted by uh, a number of the commissioners. And I was thinking, uh, we had a meeting today over uh, at Hendershot's about uh, the Southern Mills development and everybody collaborating. But the developer that's trying to get the Springdale property uh, uh, modifications that he wants uh, owns vacant blighted property in that neighborhood and has been uh, very difficult to engage. And there's a 70 year old resident that lives right next to his prop property, a 70 year uh, term resident, she's actually 95 years old, they can't go outside in the evening and the early morning because of, of his blighted property. So I was wondering how can we, how, how can we come to terms with this when it's obviously, even though he makes some very good points, that we need some, how can we come to terms not to use aging in place as marketing? And so I would just suggest to the uh, commission that it's, it's important in this issue as aging in place that perhaps we can develop some criteria so when the planning commission is confronted by this issue at another time, they have to meet in a certain established criteria 
as opposed to trying to uh, politicize the marketing plan. And I thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Smith. I'm sorry for the confusion, <laughs> but you can speak either way you want to. I'm Susan Field. I live at 150 Cloverhurst Terrace. On page 7 of the Planning Department staff report that was submitted to the Planning Commission for its August 6th meeting, the following information was included, and I quote, the application report states that the target population of the development would be senior adults. That is followed with this statement. Though the, applicants, though the application indicates intent to serve the senior population, the requested plan development zoning will not restrict the age of residents. As a senior adult myself who would be included in the targeted population, I would not want to purchase a villa in a development that could not guarantee that my neighbors would be senior adults. Such a development could have residents of all ages with a variety of interests and activities quite different from mine. Some scenarios that I can imagine for this development. It would be possible for a senior adult to purchase a villa and then allow children, grandchildren, or grandchildren to reside in that villa while they are in school or working in the Athens area with the idea that the senior adult owner would move in after the grandchildren or children no longer needed to live there. It would also be possible for the grandchildren or children to invite friends or acquaintances to move in and live with them in the villa. Then there eventually could be investors who would be interested in purchasing a villa and using it for rental property for renters of any age, perhaps even renting out the individual bedrooms within the structure itself. All of you are aware that there is an ACC ordinance, 9-15-18, that provides the definition of family restrictions in residential zones. In part, the evidence ordinance reads, it shall be unlawful for the owner of any single dwelling unit located in any RS zoning district to have more than two unrelated individuals residing therein. I live in the Bloomfield neighborhood and have had numerous experiences going through the code enforcement process for this ordinance. For a variety of reasons, this ordinance is not easily enforceable, and the continued violations of this cause a variety of problems for those of us who reside in in-town neighborhoods. I urge you to vote to deny this request. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Field. Kristen Morales, 338 Satula Avenue. I would like to share the following statement from the Board of Trustees of the athens Clark Heritage Foundation. While the Foundation encourages appropriate new development in our historic neighborhoods, the, this proposal highlights a major flaw in the county ordinances enacted to protect Athens' historical structures, and also raises concerns for one of Athens' established historic neighborhoods. As the Commission is no doubt aware, there is a historic home of significant value located on this property. The historic farmhouse dates back to the 1850s, is listed on the National Register of Historic Places, and, according to research done by a local historian, is tied to several prominent Athens families. The earliest county records available reflect the sale of this home by the Deering family to the Kamak family. Prior to this, it was the home of Anna Billips Hudgen, the younger daughter of one of Athens' most prominent families. Her late husband, Dr. Wescombe Hudgen, was a civil engineer. There's also been a diary discovered that was written by Anna's daughter, Annie, detailing her experiences growing up in the home. Annie Hudgens' diary also describes maple and poplar trees in the front yard and talks about her mother planting a dozen walnut trees on the property. The gardens also grew plum, peach, and pear trees, and the grounds were also home to tennis and croquet courts and a spring-fed pond where people would bring their boats. Over time, the house came to be owned by the Carlton family. It is believed that Henry Hull Carlton's Confederate uniform and flag were found in the attic. Carlton was also a doctor, lawyer, newspaper publisher, and builder of Athens' Cloverhurst Mansion, the grounds of which later became the Cloverhurst neighborhood. The Brackett family, the home's current owners, purchased the property from the wife of Henry Hull Carlton, Jr. As the history reveals, the house is very much connected with the history of Athens. And yet, because of a loophole in our planned development process, there's nothing in place to even alert the public that the home is in danger of being torn down. 
The demolition delay ordinance, which would normally serve as a safeguard against the unnoticed destruction of such a historic structure, does not apply in the plan development process. Because of this shortcoming of our local ordinances, once approved, a plan development site plan becomes binding, and a historic property that is in the way becomes nothing more than debris that must be removed. If this house were to be destroyed, it would be a great loss, and the fact that there is no requirement to even mention the historic home as part of the permitting process for these types of plan developments exposes a flaw in the system that should not go unnoticed or uncorrected. The athens Clark Heritage Foundation urges you to vote no on this project. This property will one day be developed, there is no doubt about that. But when it is, we hope that plans will include the preservation of this 19th century house and will respect the character of the surrounding neighborhood. That kind of development, one that respects our cultural and historical heritage, and that is in harmony with the surrounding neighborhood, will be a true asset to our community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Morales. Hi, I'm Paula Loniak. I live at 445 Ruth Street in Athens, and I brought a uh, handout. I hope you all got it. I brought it to the commissioner clerk's office this afternoon. I don't know if you've had a chance to look at it, but if you haven't, please do. Um, I've lived in Athens since 1992. I moved here to go to UGA's vet school. I turned down Cornell to go to UGA because I like Athens. And it's becoming harder and harder to find affordable housing. I look around and all I see are developments, condos, apartment complexes, all being built with students in mind. They have four bedrooms and four bathrooms. Uh, who else besides four students would need such a place? It's very discouraging for someone who's single, one income, which is not very big, and wants something simple. No pool, spa, exercise gym, and all the other bells and whistles that UGA students want. Um, tiny houses can cost a very small amount of money, as low as $12,000 to build a tiny house, and a person can live in that if they want to. Um, they can cost as much as $100,000, but they could cost as little as $15,000, depending on what kind of grade you want to go for. Um, my main idea, the main idea is that practically anyone could own their own home and not have to pay the obscene rates, the rents that are being asked for in Athens. I'm paying, with a roommate, $1,250 a month in a modest house. No, no spa, no pool, no exercise gym on Ruth Street. There is no other way I will be able to own a home unless I, it, it's a tiny house. Uh, I can't get a loan. I'm not, I won't qualify. Um, tiny houses appeal to me as they do to other people, uh, such as a young person getting started in their own, in their life after school, empty nesters who don't need or want their large houses and all the upkeep they require, people who just want to simplify their lives and leave a smaller carbon footprint on the uh, planet. Tiny house communities are popping up in and near the most more progressive cities and towns in our country and in other countries. Um, one example that I um, visited is a community in Flat Rock, North Carolina called Wildflowers, which is an ex excellent example of how to reuse some land for a better purpose, more in tune with what the citizens want and need. I want to stay in Athens. I don't want to have to move because I simply can no longer afford the rents. Athens is a progressive city town. That's why I like it here. And I've made, I've met people and made friends with all sorts of people from other veterinarians to artists to musicians to landscapers to club owners and so on. When I talk to some of my friends, they too are struggling to pay their rent and bills and have anything left over. Um, if tiny houses were allowed to be built in Athens, I and many others would be able to spend more money at local businesses because we wouldn't have huge mortgages and rents to pay. The main problem, as I see it, is that the zoning and planning for Athens doesn't allow for these types of homes and Ms. property Mr. prices. Ms. Loniak, I'm sorry. We're oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't realize I was going on. And, and, I, and I would remind people uh, who, who wish to speak that, that we to, to keep their remarks right now to this particular item, which is um, the, the bracket property rezoning. Uh, there'll be an opportunity at the, at the end of the meeting to speak to other issues. Good evening, my name is David Matheny and I live at 200 Mount Vernon Place. Before making any further remarks, I want to be clear that I have no involvement in this project and I'm only here as an interested resident at Five Points. 
My wife Becky and I have discussed this project at length and we both agree that this appears to be a quality project and that this is one is the best and highest use of the property located at Springdale. This high quality development of 14 homes located in the north edge of Five Points will make a nice buffer between our residential community and the Baxter Street Commercial District. I know that Becky and I are in minority with our neighbors with regards to this high density development, but we recognize the need to provide quality housing for adults of all ages. I'm constantly bombarded by clients wanting to live in Five Points but do not want to renovate or take care of a house and yard anymore. I'm personally sad that this development got tagged as homes for senior citizens or folks wanting to age in place. There's been a firestorm of com comments about the, how the design of these homes do not suit seniors because they are two-story and they are too large for seniors, etc. Therefore, they must really be for students. I've done my share of student housing and I can tell you that the price range and the floor plan layout do not suit or support student occupancy. The price range alone does not support someone buying one of these homes and renting to students. The return on the investment is just not there. Does that mean that a wealthy individual would not buy one of these homes and house their child and a friend? No, of course not. There's no guarantees. In fact, houses all over Five Points have been purchased for just such a reason. Probably with the idea that once the student leaves, they will make it their permanent home or second home. What this development does suggest is that couples in their 40s to 70s, and yes, even their 80s, will be wanting to invest here because they would like to downsize and enjoy Five Points. You have to realize that many of the folks buying in this price range are living in million dollar homes with anywhere from 4,500 to 6,000 plus square feet with large yards. Downsizing to them doesn't mean living in a thousand square feet. They want a place for their grown children and grandchildren to be able to visit. Aging in place means many things to many people. Perhaps aging in place with independence for as long as possible would be a better definition in this case. The idea that the development should provide guarantees that only 55 and older should be allowed to reside here is preposterous. One of the beauties of Five Points is that the age diversity that we, is the age diversity that we have. It keeps this community alive and vital. I do not want to see a wall around Five Points so there can be no longer be changed. This neighborhood has changed and evolved for many decades and thus has, seen, uh, has not seen the decline of other neighborhoods. In fact, it is more sought after than ever. Thank you. I support this project. Thank you, Mr. Matheny. Good evening. My name is Scott Reed, 70 and 80 Springdale Street. You've heard quite a few arguments tonight, and I'll recap just a few. The tree canopy is of great concern. Wonderful old trees will never be easily replaced by something new and small and low landscaping. The increased traffic is a concern to a lot of our neighbors at an intersection that already has moments when it can be a little bit hectic. The character of the development does not really suit the character of the historic neighborhoods surrounding this area. Some of the buildings adjacent to this property that were described are at best insensitive developments that were shortly after urban renewal, the 70s, 80s. The most important aspect of this, aside from its usage and the density, are the historic, important historic buildings on this property. One is a circa 1850 Greek Revival cottage that has some very specific details that give it a sense of style that we don't find in this area. It also has period outbuildings from 1850 that we never find in this area. Of cultural importance, we have clay tennis courts that tell us a lot about the people who would have lived here, who lived in this neighborhood. And Athens only has a handful of those left, and this being one of the very oldest. Only three mid-19th century buildings remain on this side of Baxter Street in this area. To, um, this house being one of them. One further down Springdale um, between Church and Bloomfield that was, according to local lore, a hardware store in the 1850s, and then an 1830s plantation plane that somehow has found its way uh, developed around on Millage Heights. 
to lose a building like this would be a tremendous loss to the neighborhoods around it and to Athens. Contrary to some beliefs, issuance of a demolition permit would be a step backwards in our progress. I am an architect and a preservationist. The architect in me very much supports sensitive progress, and the preservationist in me looks to maintain a sense of history. It would be a slap in the face to people who have been custodians of this neighborhood for many years, several of whom who have spoken tonight in opposition of this project. They have worked hard when this neighborhood was in various parts in a state of decline and they have held their ground and continue to help it improve. <coughs> One last point is that this is no longer 2008. We have a thriving real estate economy here. And just because a project comes before us does not mean that it needs to be readily accepted, especially when we see so many requests for rezoning and variances. There's a very good chance that a better option will come along for the sensitive development of this property that will work well with the surrounding neighborhoods. I urge you to consider each of these issues, those that I have mentioned and those that others have mentioned tonight. Once this is gone, our trees, our historic architecture, it cannot be brought back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Hello, my name is Katrina Evans. I live at 240 Oglethorpe Terrace, and I am a co-owner of E&E Architecture, a local firm. Um, as a local firm, we've been practicing architecture in town for over a decade, and just by nature of our lovely community, we do a lot of student housing. Um, we also do aging <coughs> in place uh, developments as well, and the two are actually very different, except with the common desire to be in a geographic, um, geographically gifted is kind of what I would call the location, um, close to a vibrant, walkable community of Five Points, as well as the university. Um, but I've been a little troubled by some of the statements that we've heard that larger residences and stairs surely mean that they're, intend they're not intended for an aging population. And I think that those statements are just general qualifications of the design um, are ageist. And if mature living is 55, there are decades in front of people to live a full life and run marathons, run up and down the stairs all they want. Um, aging in place doesn't mean that um, they're fully built out nursing suites. It means that provisions are in place and that those people or anyone would be allowed to live in their home without having to move out, just securely live in their home. Um, personally, I think that People feel better when they qualified as a student housing um, development. You know, it feels better that um, another in-town student housing development was shut down. Um, this developer or any other future developer could, by right, build five five-bedroom homes and pack them conservatively with 25 students. Um, but he didn't. He took a risk and thought outside the box. Um, Developers regularly target this, our community, as student housing. This one actually didn't. Um, beyond the many hypotheticals that have flown around here tonight, um, to me, a reality is that voting this project down sends the message that retirees are not welcome in our community, despite all the evidence they hear otherwise. Um, and if you shut the door on this project, you're sending the message that other desirable locations in town aren't capable of having a higher, more diverse use. Um, you're sending a message that retirees can embrace Athens, but they're going to live in Oconee County. So to me, that means that maybe we should stop basking in the glow of all the positive press that highlights our beloved town as a retirement destination. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Anyone else wish to speak before we come behind? My name is Kyla Marshall Adams. Uh, I'm 74 years old, and except for seven years I've lived in Brazil, I've lived in Athens, Georgia. Um, there, I, I have to preface my comments about the 
development by telling you about my disappointment in the comportment of the planning commissioners. That is not all of them, but some of them. They were flippant in the way they presented their comments. And it seems that, Brad, they might need a, uh, to be furnished with a glossary and a, uh, a guide to their responsibilities to the community on the, when they serve on the, on the planning commission because they clearly don't have the best interest of the uh, community in mind. And, and one example of the words that should be defined in the glossary uh, would be enhance. Uh, that's mentioned in the plan development uh, guidelines, and, and there's nothing about this thing that enhances our community. Um, I think there's enough been said, uh, but I don't want to assume anything. My brother, older brother, taught me something about making assumptions. Uh, uh, he's a retired Army general. And he said, let me tell you, buddy, any time you make an, ass an uh, assumption in my business, you're dead. Well, uh, we're dead in the water if we let stuff like this get by us. Uh, the uh, 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 biggest thing that sticks in my craw right now is the, the, uh, is the use of meaningless euphemisms. And aging in place is one of them. Uh, aging is defined by the local council on aging. It says that aging, everyone's doing it. That's true. If you still got a pulse and you're in place, uh, you're aging in place. So there's, <laughs> there's nothing to that that defines anything. That's a meaningless euphemism. Another meaningless uh, euphemism that I, I wish... Uh, the mayor and commission would address is this uh, single family zoning thing. Um, my wife, by the way, who's also a native Athenian and very much interested in uh, real estate uh, matters, uh, we have a, a substantial interest in an area that is uh, zoned in one of these meaningless euphemisms. Uh, you only have to look at the properties behind. We live on Cloverhurst. You look at the properties behind us with the exception of these people right here. And they're anywhere from three to five cars on every property. Buck, I hate to interrupt you, but you're out of time. <laughs> anyway. My name is Kathy Horde, and I live at 248 Springdale Street, and I have the unfortunate opportunity to follow Buck Adams at the podium. <laughs> As I have thought about tonight's proceedings, I was reminded of a, of a biblical teaching from the book of Luke, which instructs us that to whom much is given, much is expected. As the gatekeepers of our community's resources to include the allocation of zoning density, I would ask you to reflect upon this teaching and ensure that if you award additional density to a developer, in this case far in excess of 100 percent, that much be expected of this individual and that the project for which the exit and for which the extra density is awarded be of benefit to both the neighborhood in which it is located and to our general community. We are counting on you to ensure this. It is important to us as residents of this community that when zoning decisions are made where much is given, that the benefit for the project is more than the personal financial benefit to the developer, but rather, again, benefits the neighborhood in which the project resides and the greater community as a whole. It is unfortunate, but this project does neither. As a neighbor for almost four decades, 
of this property, I would ask that you simply reject it this evening. And I know that there are people in the audience this evening who've not spoken, and I would like to ask those who are here with concerns this evening about the project, if you would just simply raise your hand. Thank you. I think they have spoken with their hands. Um, I would like to thank each of you for your thoughtful consideration of this effort and also for your service to our community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ford. Yes, ma'am. Come. Honorable Mayor Dick Denson and Commissioners, O.C. Carlisle, I live over on the east side, 155 South Stratford Drive. I grew up in Athens, Georgia, in a home in the Five Points area. My soul is still in Five Points. I urge all of you, please listen to the neighbors who live in the Five Points area and reject this proposal. Thank you very much indeed for this opportunity. Thank you, Ms. Carlisle. Anyone else wish to speak? Okay, we're going to come behind the rail and uh, this is uh, in Mr. Hamby's district, so would you like to speak to it? Yes, ma'am, I'll be glad to. And actually, Commissioner Bell represents the um, other side of this over on uh, at the corner of Springdale and Rock Springs. And I would like to, to um, uh, say uh, certainly there's appreciation there for this petitioner, uh, uh, Mr. York, bringing forward a, a, uh, uh, the conversation of concept of aging in place. And it's certainly a concept that I think... Um, I think, well, I don't think, I know that the majority of the residents within this area and certainly the majority of this commission behind the rail uh, would fully embrace, uh, and they do it in a heartbeat. The, the situation with this project, however, is, is it's, there are, are a lot of concerns that there, there uh, isn't the guarantee there uh, that this would truly be an aging in place uh, facility. And, um, and I certainly appreciate uh, the work that uh, Ms. Evans and Mr. Smith, who have helped with this project, do. They've done some good work uh, throughout the community uh, for a number of years. The, this project came to our attention, and it came to Commissioner Bell's and former Commissioner Hoard's attention, oh, probably a little bit late last year. And we met uh, with, with uh, uh, Mr. York, and he had a plan in place. Uh, he showed us it, and, um, and we gave him our thoughts on it. And he said that this would be an aging in place facility. So that term was tagged by Jared York, uh, not, not us behind the rail. And, and that's what this whole plan development is based on, is an aging in place facility. And when we go to look at it, and, and we, we see um, that there's, and whether or not you think it's designed that way or not, at the end of the day, uh, there are still no guarantees that this would actually be an aging in place facility. A lot of talk has been uh, mentioned about student housing. And I think we're making the assumption that all student housing is just four bedrooms, four baths, and that's not the case. You know, I can remember growing up, uh, uh, or not growing up, when I first came to college, I lived in a dorm first. I had a you know, roommate and no bathroom. Uh, I also had a, um, well, the bathroom was down the hall, but then, <laughs> then uh, the, the following year, I lived, uh, I lived with, uh, with uh, two other folks, so it was three of us. We had two bedrooms and one bath, and I remember each quarter, this is when we were on the qu quarter system, uh, we flipped a coin to see who would get the bedroom by themselves. And uh, I never got that bedroom by myself. And uh, the following year, I actually lived with my brother, and that was the most difficult thing. We lived in a, in a very, very small uh, uh, one-bedroom uh, place. I had one bath, and, uh, and I lost the flip coin uh, there as well. So uh, that probably goes to explain some reasons the way I am. But uh, for this instance, I'm hoping it explains that students uh, will live anywhere. And, uh, and certainly on Springdale, they do. Uh, Springdale's a heavily uh, rented street, and uh, and that's the concern here. You know, it's not it's not that it's a four bed it's not that it's not a four bedroom four bath. It's that we know that students uh, will live in in, in facilities uh, where where they uh, where they want to live, and this is a convenient place for students to live. Certainly, uh, it's um, walking distance to campus. You can see that with the parking in Five Points and the number of parking restrictions we have on on the streets within Five Points and Yellow Curb. So certainly, there's an impact here. So. I say all that uh, to say, you know, there's no guarantee in this that it's an aging in place facility. Uh, uh, there's a risk associated 
uh, for the neighbors uh, by that risk not being being made available for them. And we, uh, Commissioner Bell, uh, former Commissioner Horde, and uh, myself all expressed this at that very first meeting. Says, make sure uh, that there's something in place that uh, the neighbors can feel comfortable with, and uh, in the age of that. I just, I just, and there was mention of uh, of this being a, a, a vacant or blighted property. And, you know, I can. Um, a lot of people were saying the same thing about the, the Honeycutt House. If y'all, um, I know probably uh, Commissioner Wright and uh, Commissioner Bell are familiar with that. It's on the corner of a uh, Woodlawn and Millage. And right now, a family is restoring that house to move into it. Uh, that was certainly <laughs> a, a, a blighted piece of property that's getting fixed up quite a bit. And and um, so, with that said, with the you know certainly the, the concern over. Uh, the guarantee of this being an aging place, uh, the concern and, and the realization that, you know, students will basically live where it's convenient for them to live, regardless, I think, if it's a four-bedroom, four-bath. Sure, I'd love to have a four-bedroom, four-bath, but I didn't. And uh, I know a lot of students out there are, are probably liked in that situation as well. And, uh, and so let me make sure I've hit all the high points here, and certainly the, the speakers uh, tonight in our conversation at the agenda setting um, hit a lot of the concerns that, that everybody has over this particular project. But I do want to reiterate the point. We, we would welcome an aging in place facility. Uh, we understand uh, the importance of that. And we just want to make sure that, uh, that it is going to be, it would be that, and that there are some associative guarantees uh, within that. So with all that said, I'm going to go ahead and make a motion to uh, Sure. I mean, I, I would have waited till after the motion was in, but this is, it's fine. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Nope, um, not a problem. This is an ordinance to amend the code of Athens, Clark County, Georgia, with respect to zoning the approximate 3.21 acre tract of land comprised of two parcels of land located at 338 and 348 Springdale Street from RS-15, single family residential, to RS-5PD, single family residential plan development, and for other purposes. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Hamby, did you want to make a motion? Let's, let's, let's get the motion on the floor and then we'll come back for discussion. Sure, I'll be glad to make a motion and I'll just uh, go ahead and make a, a motion to uh, deny the project. Do I have a second? Okay, Mr. Neesmith. Um, Mr. Davis, can you explain to us, I think I know, but we have this, this note on our desk that signs its official document all. It's called Constitutional Challenge. Would you explain why this document is here? and what its purpose is. Sure. Um, this is basically a notice of a potential takings claim. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that, that, um, that the developer will sue, but it's necessary to provide this kind of notice in order to preserve their right to do so if they decide at some point uh, to sue. It doesn't mean that they necessarily will. It's pretty hard to win takings claims in Georgia. The courts have set the bar pretty high. Um, and I can tell you as much or as little about this as you want. I think I'm interested in knowing, is this a fairly normal document to appear in one of these uh, zoning it, I mean, it happens all the time. It's necessary <clears throat> to provide this kind of notice in case they decide to pursue court action later on. It doesn't necessarily mean that they will, but they might. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for getting that clarified, Ms. Bell. When I took my oath of office in January, I had made a promise after our schooling in December to learn more about commission work. And one of the things they taught us in that school was to listen. And I have, I have listened and listened and listened. And over the last couple of months, it has been unbelievable at the listening, the emails, the response regarding this issue. And a part of me knows what I feel like is right for the right reasons because I did that. So I will definitely support the negative side of this to not go forward. Thank you, and I think I wanted to be sure that this was clarified, that this was not going to be an issue for Thank you. anything before involving our again, vote. Let me see if there's anybody, did anybody else wish to speak before Mr. Neesmith speaks again? Go ahead. Uh, just uh, quick, I, I want to be sure that the public understands that this is not a message to retirees not to come to Athens. If we deny this, it's going to be a message to developers 
to develop the right product for retirees. I've studied this document, this, this, the petition, looked at the homeowner association restrictions and so forth. My parents lived in an aging in place home in Oconee County off of, off of Rock Springs. Uh, I, I, I helped with their homeowners association with some issues. This in no way resembles the kinds of covenants and rules they had for an, an aging in place home. So I, I, I just don't buy it. But it, we do not want our retirees to think this is a message. They're not welcome here. They certainly are. Thank you, Mr. Neesman. Anybody else? Ms. Lank. Yeah, um, I just want to address a few things. I mean, we, we had plenty of discussion about this during the agenda setting meeting. And I, I think that Commissioner Hoard uh, kind of hit the nose on the head or the nail on the head. Um, talking about, you know, if we're going to give up this density, we should expect something in return. And I don't see that with this project. I really don't. Um, I am not opposed to increasing density. I, I believe we're going to have to do it in our in-town neighborhoods. We're going to have to take a, a good hard look at our, our zoning guidelines in, in the near future and, and, and do it. But I don't believe this is the proper way to do it. Um, and I don't believe this facility is, is conducive to aging in place. These are large two-story homes. And if you count the rooms, those are technically six bedroom units like mike said when you're in college you'll you'll live anywhere that keeping room could be a bedroom that office could be a bedroom that loft could be a bedroom that storage room could be a bedroom um you know there's it's wide open to student housing and without the kind of restrictions and covenants in place that's what it very likely will become um and there is there's nothing else for the neighbor i mean this has this small interior green space but it doesn't offer the neighborhood anything um, you know, I, I would also like to see a project that had a more diverse selection of housing, um, not just this kind of large scale high end housing, but, you know, if you want to have retirees who want to scale down, my parents are, are looking to, to retire now too, and they're looking to scale down. Um, most folks I know who are ready to retire are ready to scale down. Um, I believe we, we need to embrace diversity when we're, we're increasing our density and um, that could also make these projects more affordable um, you know we do have an affordable housing crisis and you know I spent a lot of time riding around town yesterday with uh, Spencer Fry from Habitat for Humanity and he showed me some of the projects that they're doing and some of the potential projects and I spent plenty of time riding around town with uh, Heather Benham from the Athens Land Trust and you know, we do have our needs and we're about to see a workforce housing study and, and we're going to have a really good idea of what our, our real needs are. And I think that, you know, when we're approving these kind of planned developments and we have the opportunity to make some kind of statement on what we really want to see, we should seize it. Um, and this is not the kind of project that we really need to see. And um, I hope that we can see a new project that will actually meet the needs of this community. Thank you, Ms. Anybody else? Okay, you guys ready to vote? Oh, Mr. Harris, did you want to say something? Well, just, just a brief vote. I, mean, I agree with what Mr. Nixon is saying. And, uh, I, mean, I, I read the proposal in the, the petition, uh, and, I, and I thought you mentioned there were some issues with the covenants. And, you know, for better or worse, in my, in my other full time job, I spend a lot of time with texts. And what's interesting about the, the proposed restrictive covenants here is that. They've been cleverly written in such a way to suggest that this is going to be an Asian-based development and that this will be included in the covenants, but they, they don't actually say that. And I think the developer could have settled the issue about Asian in place if they had specifically put something in here about that. And the fact that they didn't, to me, tells me everything I need to know about the development. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Anyone else? Okay, all in, all in favor of... Mr. Hamby's motion to reject the uh, proposal in the uh, KBI. Any opposed? Okay. And th this is the time in our agenda that any citizen who wishes to speak to us about any item that was not on tonight's agenda may come forward, and we will have our, our normal three minute limit. Does anybody need a break? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm, but does anybody need a break? Should I wait? <laughs> yeah, wait a minute. Okay. Yeah.
And thank you all, all you folks for coming visiting us tonight. But come back to see us when you're a senior. Jim Thompson, would you do me a favor and close the door when everybody's finished? Yeah, sorry, never mind. I don't think you heard me. Okay. Okay, Hi, good now. evening. Um, my name is Amy Cassane. I live at 526 Highland Avenue. And um, the discussion that we just had about the proposed development in Five Points, I, I live in Five Points and I, I get the Friends of Five Points emails, and it's really struck me this project has brought out a lot more comments than I've heard in a long time about development in Five Points. And, um, you know, I, this project doesn't necessarily fall into the category I'm going to talk about what, but my concern as a resident of Five Points, as the director of the Athens Clark Carriage Foundation, as a resident of this community, is the degree to which teardowns and the building of much larger houses in Five Points, and I think I know it's happened in East Athens, I'm sure it's happening in other places, but in Five Points, it's happening more and more regularly. And I think the comments on the listserv, which talked about trees and the concern for trees, and which talked about this project, I think part of the frustration that was being expressed is due to all of a sudden things that we've been warning people about for a couple of years, all of a sudden people are beginning to think, oh wait, maybe there's something to those concerns. I mean, I could take any of you on a tour if you don't live at Five Points and show you where somewhat modest houses by today's standards have been torn down literally sometimes in 15 minutes and hauled off to the dumpster. So that's point number one. Do we not have a law that says you have to try to salvage some of this stuff? I mean, that's disgusting to me. I've sat there, watched a house, 15 minutes come down, be driven off to the landfill, it's incredible. I mean, I can't believe in a progressive community like ours that values recycling that we let people do that. So that's number one. Two, I'd rather not see them torn down in the first place. And the thing that people don't realize is that an awful lot of five points is not made up of huge houses. It's such a desirable place to live that everybody thinks, oh, it's grand mansions. It's not. It's made up of mostly modest sized houses on these beautiful lots with beautiful trees and that's why people value it and yet you drive around five points today and you will see these houses being replaced one after the other by houses that are sometimes five times six times the size of what was there there's one on McCorder right now where the garage alone i guess it's a garage because it's basically two equal sized structures that have been put on this lot the one is bigger than the house next door, and it's the garage, and it's bigger than the house next door. My understanding is that Kathy Hoard, before she retired, put in a request for an infill ordinance to be looked at in this county. What an infill ordinance will do is this, is that our current zoning does not take into account what is on the ground in five points and probably other areas. An infill ordinance says, okay, here's the zoning, but if that zoning allows you to do something that is completely incompatible and inappropriate with what is on the ground, it makes you scale it back. And I would urge the commission to move forward on looking at an infill ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kassain. Jesse Hool. Um, I live over on Hill Street. I actually forget the number. It's the same address given earlier by Laura, the broken arm. Um, I wasn't originally going to speak tonight, but I feel compelled to because a couple things were spoken at great length, namely this last issue, um, which brings to mind gentrification for me. Um, and then only barely was touched upon, although I do appreciate the discussion behind the rail about item eight with the telephone services contract and both bring to my mind a pretty big I guess it's not really an elephant in the room because it's not really in this room it's not enough of the discussion and I fear that most of the people who have the time and the connectedness to the dialogue um, aren't part of the discussion even when citizen input is allowed um, which is the issue of poverty and inequality 
and I don't want everyone behind the rail to forget that we have the worst poverty rate of any urban county in the country, and one of the worst wealth inequality rates of any county, period. I think it's number 10 or 12 by the last report in the whole country. And wealth inequality is a massive issue nationwide, which means that it's especially a huge issue here. I would also like us not to forget the inequality that exists around gender and age, and especially race, how disproportionately the inequality in our community affects people of color. <clears throat> um, sorry, I didn't have anything prepared, so I'm a little grateful that I have more minutes than I probably need. But um, charging people in prison to make phone calls might be the norm that we're accustomed to to help uh, pay for our budget. Um, but there might be other ways that we can think more creatively to make that money that might come from people who can afford it more instead of this cycle of people going into our prisons, coming back out, and going right back in with such a high recidivism rate, such a high rate of imprisoning low-income people and people of color in this community, the disproportionate rate with which we arrest and imprison people of color for nonviolent drug offenses, I know is an issue that's come before this panel, maybe with people speaking angrily sometimes, not with the best tact, I've certainly been there. I'm sure most of you haven't forgotten. <laughs> um, but there are ways for us to not need to get a quarter of a million dollars from the people who can afford to pay it the least. And let us not forget that the families they're calling probably can't afford it either. Um, and there are ways for us to develop housing that can be better. I think the infill ordinance is a great idea. I think there's lots of other things we can look into. Staff is tasked with keeping things rolling as they are. Y'all are tasked with reimagining how things can roll differently. I really appreciate what you said about listening. For every one person that comes in here, there are many more who can't or don't. And just because they're not coming in here doesn't mean they don't need to be listened to. And just because they're not speaking doesn't mean they don't have problems that need to be addressed. So, thank you, Jason. Thank you. Hi. My name is Russell Edwards. I live at 400 Duncan Springs Road. Um, I would like to echo the concerns raised by Ms. Kassane this evening. I live in Five Points of Duncan Springs Road, and uh, something that she has described is, is happening across the street from my house. Um, a wealthy, out-of-town uh, person uh, purchased a home for $250,000 and promptly clear-cut the entire lot. She cut 47 trees off the lot, uh, many mature hardwoods. Uh, then she uh, bulldozed the home that was there. Uh, this was not a blighted property. It was a modest home uh, that fit into the character of our community on Duncan Springs Road, which is a very special place. Uh, the lots back up to the middle Oconee River. It's a beautiful area. Um, I, I'm appalled that, that something like that uh, could happen. Um, I've been talking at length with uh, the Community Protection Division, the Building Inspector, and the Planning Commission. Uh, basically, the only thing that, that we could do is uh, get the developer to sit down and agree to replace uh, the Clark County trees that he cut down out of the right-of-way, uh, trees that belong to all of us. Um, I strongly encourage the commission to look at infill development because it is happening in five points. Um, the same person that did this on my street uh, has purchased a home on Rutherford and has done the exact same thing. Um, I was driving by there the other day. She clear cut the entire lot and is farther along in the project now and has built just a humongous out of scale uh, structure in the middle of, of uh, the beautiful Rutherford neighborhood. Um, our existing codes seem to work okay for people that live in this community and they want to conscientiously develop a lot and build a home, uh, but they're leaving the door wide open for people who really don't care about the community to come in and do something that I've witnessed firsthand across the street on uh, 350 Terrell Drive. If you go by there and look at it, uh, a complete clear cut in a historic neighborhood, uh, not technically historic, um, 
But this completely changed the character of that entire uh, end of Duncan Springs Road. I'm sure Commissioner Bell has seen it. Uh, 47 trees, what once was a shaded, nice, beautiful area with homes about the same size, uh, is now uh, a big mud pit. Uh, it's, it's a shame. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. Anyone else? Tim Denson, 290 Midway Road. Uh, I'm going to talk about the jail phone some more because I think it needs to be talked about. I think these are things that you guys don't want to talk about. I think it's things that nobody wants to talk about. And it was amazing the way the talk behind the bar here that nobody mentioned that there's a difference between covering the cost of a service and making a, a, an extra revenue, a profit of $1.25 million off of people and their families who haven't even been convicted yet. They can be innocent. And they're sitting in there. And they're sitting in a very horrible situation. And their families are in a very horrible situation. I don't know how many of you guys have ever been, I think, on a jail, go to jail before. I've had to go to jail before. It sucks. And you want to talk to somebody who can make you feel better. You want to talk to a lawyer who can possibly help prove that you're innocent or make the situation better. You just basically want to talk to somebody who's on your side. And the thing is, in that situation, you will pay an exorbitant amount of money. And you guys are making them pay an exorbitant amount of money. Heck, I mean, why stop at this rate? We can, maybe we can just finance the jail all together with our phone system. Because you know what? A lot of these people will probably pay it. So think about this. Think about what you're doing. You're profiting. And if we want to talk about fixing this and making this so we don't have to have the jail be the most expensive part of our county, how about we stop sending less people to our jail instead? How about we actually start changing some of our laws and our policies so that we don't put as many people there so that it is the most expensive part of our county? I am disappointed in the ease of avoiding this issue. Um, I'm disappointed that this wasn't talked about beforehand. I'm Thank God I came across and looked at it earlier this afternoon. Um, you guys need to do better. Thank you, Mr. Jensen. Anyone else wish to speak? Mark, Mark McConnell, 2510 Commerce Road. I agree with Tim. It sucks. I uh, had to spend a couple of days in jail here. My hair was too long. They just said, no, you can't walk down the street like that. No, I'm only kidding. But um, it's, really, it's really hard to make a call out of there. I mean, it's not like you don't have the resources there. Like if there was an ATM machine there and you could say, oh, yeah, I got my bail money right here, that would be nice and easy. But just trying to get a hold of a family member, uh, I remember when you could only call a landline. Now, who has a landline? I hope that isn't the way it still is. You do? All right. Well, a couple people still do. Well, give me your number so the next time, and just in case, I know somebody I can call. Because I don't know that many people that have landlines anymore. So you couldn't call a cell phone. Uh, this was a few years back, and I don't go into the things. But uh, um, it's really not a good system that they have uh, in the jails for uh, people who are there. Um, to be able to get a hold of someone on the outside, it really, really needs to be changed. Um, you know, you can have an unlimited plan on your cell phone and you can make how many calls? Forever, right? And it costs, what, $40 a month? And you can have unlimited calling? It seems in this day and age that we should be able to come up with some other something than besides having to... Uh, uh, set up a, a service with an outside provider who's going to try to contact someone on the other end. This is 2015. That's like ancient history. It was faster to dial a rotary phone. Trying to get a hold of someone when you're in jail is very, very difficult. And it means that people will stay in there longer, which costs the county more money. So really, it, it doesn't make any sense to not do something about this. And the fact that the county profits off of it, I understand as a business owner, bills have to be paid, but that's not the right way. 
That's like me cutting down those those trees over there across from Russell's house uh, for the money because I would just tell them, no, sorry, I can't do that. Um, but, you know, so it's it's a moral issue, um, just like the stuff that uh, we were talking about. You know, when I talk about the wetlands and I talk about trees and carbon sequestration and, and what's happening with the world. I mean, we have to be aware of the big picture out there and what's happening all over the world. It's not just us, not just one little thing. You know, we have to take everything in consideration. So look at the big picture and, and let's think about making a better moral decision as far as that goes. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, Mr. McConnell. Anyone else want to speak? Uh, my name is Gretchen Elsner. My mailing address is Box 562, Athens. Um, Mayor Denson, I was at a, a public event last week, and you stood up uh, to um, take advantage of that forum to make a statement about uh, the action that you and then half of the commission took in abdicating protection of our wetlands. And um, many people walked out, and I wanted to start singing a song to try to interrupt you, but I thought that would be inappropriate, so I figured I would wait to serenade you when I actually have some time. Um, in discussion with people after that event, I came to find out that uh, Ms. Dickerson, who kind of blindsided that ordinance, is actually a family friend, which, I mean, I, I, it would lead me to, to possibly believe that in some cases, perhaps there are backroom negotiations going on between people and operating our government like some sort of private business, which I don't feel like has much place in a democratic process, and I appreciate that you're willing and able to listen to your constituents, because you ignored the advice of scientists and many passionate people. So. I tried to uh, get the song together for you. Nancy Denson's got me so upset. Diane Bell made me lose my rest. But everybody knows about Sharon Dickerson. Yeah, can't you see it? Don't you breathe it? It's all in the air. The planet can't stand pollution much longer. Somebody say a prayer. Wetlands protections? Oh no. Luxury condos? Let's go. Mass participation? Too low. Backroom negotiations? Faux show. Lord have mercy on this land of mine. We're all gonna get it in due time. I don't trust you anymore. The first Earth Day was before I was born. I know you try to do your very best to stand up and be counted with all the rest. You just want to sell property. We just want water quality. Everybody knows about Andy Herod. Everybody knows about Diane Bell. And everybody knows about Michael Hamby. Everybody knows about Harry Sims. And everybody knows about Nancy Denson. Everybody knows about Sharon Dickerson. Yeah. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Never been serenaded before. Anyone else wish to speak? Okay, it looks like uh, our audience participation is over. We'll come behind the rail and uh, Gene, our appointments. Do we have that in my book? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I understand that. I'm, I'm trying to. Oh. To the, to the committee that with um, HCP. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just. I didn't have anything in here with the actual name of the, of the group, the committee. Have you got that with you? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's been a long meeting, guys. Uh, I have one thing tonight to, to bring to the commission, and um, and it's and it's our um, Georgia um, Housing Initiative appointments, and Sharon Dickerson and Diane Bell have agreed to represent us on this committee uh, with uh, some other individuals with HCD. So thank thank you to the two of you. And uh, with that, I'll ask Mr. Reddish if he has anything to bring to us. Not tonight. Thank, thank you. Uh, Mr. Behrman? Uh, nothing. Thank you. Ms. Maddox? I do not, Madam Mayor. Okay.
Okay. Uh, well, we'll uh, receive comments from our commissioners, and we'll start with with uh, Commissioner Dickerson, and end with uh, Commissioner Herod. So. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have a few comments. First of all, I wanted to acknowledge um, additional help this week and actually last week with from uh, the planning, building and uh, permits and inspection and code enforcement about an issue we're de dealing with out in Snapfinger, which actually echoes a lot of what we heard tonight about the Springdale project um, and other things um, where clear cutting trees has occurred and filling the yard with concrete has occurred and having too many people in the house has occurred. And this is a single family home. Um, and it's out of character with the neighborhood and it's happening in my backyard. So it's not just happening downtown, it's happening out in our area as well. So definitely something I think we need to try to figure out how to address in some form or fashion. Um, also wanted to thank the Athens Land Trust and the Housing Community Development Department, as well as the manager's office who arranged for us to take a trip to Chapel Hill to look at their inclusionary zoning. I think it was really educational. It gave us some perspective about some things we might wanna look at doing here and what may or may not work. Um, I uh, also want to remind everybody um, that the 20th anniversary of the MRF, the Recovered Materials Processing Facility, is um, Sunday, September 27th at 2 o'clock. It's open to the public. Um, my baby has grown up. <laughs> Got graduating. Um, it'll be at 699 Hancock Industrial Way, um, and everybody's invited to attend. Um, and the only thing I'd like to, I, I don't, I would normally not address anything that was said either, but I kind of feel the need to, to let's make clear what happened with uh, what happened with the wetlands issue. And I'd like to say, um, and I'd loved your voice. You have a beautiful singing voice. Um, uh, I'd like to just remind everybody that what happened with that recommendation, that proposal, um, was something that I think protected our rivers and our streams more so than. Commissioner Gertz's proposal that was before everyone, which was going to reduce um, the buffers on our rivers and streams, and we were trying to protect that. So we went beyond what he was going to do, and we also said, let's talk about it some more and try to make a targeted approach at dealing with what we can do to properly protect our wetlands. So um, just for the purpose of clarification. Um, and the only other thing I think I'll say is, and this is in regard to something that was said as well, um, I think um, I think it's probably not probably probably wasn't the appropriate word perhaps, but I don't think that Athens Clark County profits from jail inmate telephone calls. I don't think that's the right way to put it because the jail we're not netting a profit on this. It's still costing us to run the jail. Maybe that's not the the best way to handle the inmate call situation, but you know this isn't something we're doing that nobody else is doing either. It doesn't mean that we should do it just because everybody else is doing it, but this is sort of a typical practice that's that is across the board, and so. Doesn't mean we shouldn't think outside the box, but I want to make it clear we're certainly not profiting from this. We we are offsetting some costs, but we are still it still costs a lot of money to run that jail. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dickerson. Mr. Sims. No comment. Ms. Lane. Um, yeah, we we talk a lot about housing tonight. Um, and I, I want to thank um, Paul Loniak for bringing up the town the tiny house <coughs> movement. Um, this is a movement and there's great interest in it and you know, if we're going to accommodate the need for affordable housing, which we, you know, we're learning more and more that we, we definitely need. And I was on that trip to Chapel Hill. Um, we, it was extremely enlightening. Um, you know, we learned about their mechanism for inclusionary zoning and the fact that they have bargaining power in enforcing this inclusionary zoning because their design guidelines and their density is of a level where they can offer density bonuses and get those affordable units or have developers pay in lieu payments so affordable units can be rehabbed or new units built. Um, we really don't have that mechanism. We're seeing, you know, most of our large scale high end development downtown and we're at maximum density downtown. We have no more capacity to go above the 200 bedrooms per acre. Um, if we were to utilize inclusionary zoning, we would need to seriously reconsider our downtown zoning and design guidelines to give us that bargaining power. When we do have something like a planned development, you know, that's where you, you can get that bargaining power. And the project we saw tonight you know, it, there wasn't really anything in it that would have given back to the community. And I think we need to consider that more and more instead of just haphazardly allowing projects to move forward, we need to start asking how does this fit the needs of our community, not just the needs and wants of that developer for maximum profit, but the needs of our community. 
Um, we're bleeding our creative talent. We're bleeding our, our young creative people. Um, you know, we heard yesterday from a gentleman who's in the biotech industry. We hear from Mr. Flannery from For Athens. Um, we do not have that up and coming generation. We don't have the housing to, to suit them. We don't have, you know, the lower moderate income housing. Um, we don't have the income, the, the in-town housing that they are desiring. You know, we have plenty of student housing, four bedroom, four bath. This is a conversation that's going to need to happen. And, and yes, I want to know where is that infill housing ordinance? That is a tool that could help keep our in-town neighborhoods affordable. Um, we see the property values rising because of the potential for demo demolishing and rebuilding large-scale high-end homes. Um, we had a work session with the planning department back in the spring, and that was one of the items on their their plan list was they said by this summer we were going to see an infill housing ordinance. I haven't seen anything. I have, I, you know, I've inquired a couple times, haven't heard anything. I'm hoping this, this summer is technically over, September 21st, so perhaps we'll see that infill housing ordinance by then. Um, as far as the trees go, we, we need to take a new look at our tree ordinance and those environmental areas. You know, our environmental areas, buffer protections for streams and rivers are pretty much non-existent in our residential neighborhoods. There's a 2,500 square foot encroachment allowance, and I'm seeing this right now in my neighborhood on Nantahala, a property actually being developed by Mr. York, who is before us tonight, is being built 95% of this home is being built in the stream buffer. And he got around um, that ever becoming a public issue because he be began clear cutting the lot without even requesting a building permit. So he was cited for that, got a slap on the hand, but the project's moving forward. So, you know, there are loopholes. That, that historic home, an 1850 home in Five Points, no one would have ever known that that was coming down. Um, so we, we need to look, take a serious look at our codes and, and a look at what our needs are in this community and what kind of bargaining chips we have to encourage the kind of development that our community actually needs. I, too, am looking forward for that infill ordinance to show up. Um, but that's all. I, that's my only comment tonight. I don't really have anything, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Nor do I. Thank you. I just have a couple of items. And I'm just uh, I'm wondering if we can request from uh, Manager Reddish an update on where uh, our planning department is on the on the infill study, infill study ordinance, uh, just uh, from that standpoint. Uh, I would also like to uh, thank our police department and our public works department, if y'all remember, uh, we had that really sort of storm that came upon us quite suddenly uh, one day and uh, knocked a few trees and limbs down and a lot of uh, uh, a lot of water uh, around. I actually was driving around and, and noticed that um, uh, both uh, there was a tree down in a house of an, of an elderly couple that, uh, that lives near me and the tree had actually gone through the front door and uh, drove by and uh, the, a police officer with athens Clark County was there uh, with a chainsaw getting by himself getting the tree out of the door. Uh, and I saw the same situation with some public works uh, personnel getting some, with the chainsaw, getting some trees out of, out of the middle of the road. So certainly appreciate it. And it's uh, good to know that when things like that happen, there, there are, we do have uh, our police department and public work department are, are ready to help. I'd also like to thank uh, our public uh, uh, Works Department, uh, David Clark and Brad Griffith and uh, Assistant Manager Blaine Williams for helping with an issue in Anna's Walk. Uh, the folks there are very appreciative and uh, it's an issue that's moving forward, but it's uh, it's nice of them to uh, take time and, and help some residents uh, figure out how to how to solve a problem So uh, uh, and make their neighborhood better. So at any rate, that's all I've got. Thank you. And I appreciate your support on the uh, Springdale issue. Two years and four months ago, something happened over on Oconee Hill. The church, Oconee Street United Methodist Church, burned completely down. And last Sunday, they had a rededication of a beautiful, beautiful building. Uh, I was looking for someone and somewhere to sit, and there was a Harry Sim sitting all by himself, so he and I sat together uh, for this wonderful two-hour service of a rededication. It was just awesome. But one of the th stories at the end of the the dedication was they don't owe a penny and it's just a beautiful structure if you have a chance sometime go see it it's lovely mr harry
without wanting to, to rehash the whole buffer issue, I do think it's important for the public to understand what uh, the issue was there. And what process, it may have increased them in other parts of the streams. But the science tells us that the most important part of a buffer is that part that is closest to the stream um, or the river. And so the quote-unquote Gertz proposal uh, had the very real potential to um, diminish the width of buffers on many of our rivers and streams. And I think it's important to remember that what the uh, vote what the commission with the support of the mayor did at our last meeting was not to say that we're not going to look at buffers. What it was to do was to say that we're going to look at the issue of water quality in a more holistic sense and direct our staff to come up with some uh, proposals or solutions to deal with that. And that does not preclude looking at the issue of buffers on wetlands later on. What it does do, though, is to say that we're going to look at the issue of water quality and buffers in a holistic, broad sense. And it denied the buffer averaging um, proposal, which I think had the very real potential to diminish the value of the buffers that we already have on many of our rivers and streams. And that's what the issue was, or at least it was for me. So uh, with before, that. Before you ask to, to adjourn, Mr. Hamby asked to be recognized one for just well, a do, minute. Do, do, I just want to make an do, announcement. Do I have to recognize him? <laughs> there was something, I, I usually do this, I forget to say something, but I noticed that our representative Chuck Williams is in the audience. And it reminded me that uh, on September 15th, myself, along with Commissioner Dickerson and Commissioner Link, will be hosting at the Federation of Neighborhood a question and answer session with our state representatives. And uh, it should be a blast. So thank you. Uh, thank you. And I'll make a motion to adjourn. I'll second. Can we have some discussion? About, about whether or not to adjourn. Well, <laughs> well yes, I, we'll have one, one piece of discussion before we, we vote. And I want to thank both Commissioner Dickerson and Commissioner Herod for clarifying what the issue was on the wetlands because, because it, it has been very greatly misrepresented in our community. And that's why I pitched what the flagpole called a hissy fit because I was trying to correct some misinformation. So thank you all for doing that for us. And all in favor of adjourn? Let's go home.